The Joe Rogan Experience is brought to you by Onnit.com. If you go to O-N-N-I-T, get yourself some Alpha Brain, Shroom Tech Sport, Shroom Tech Immune. What is all the stuff I'm talking about? These are all nootropics. What does that mean? Google it, bitch. Go to G-O-O-G-L-E. Enter in all the information <laughs> that you're interested in getting because you need to find out what the fuck like, what you're you putting saying? in your body. I'm telling people to Google <laughs> shit. Don't just buy our products is what I'm saying. What it is is they're nutrients that are designed and engineered to improve the way your brain produces neurotransmitters. It's a very complicated and uh, very controversial subject, but uh, they do work. There are a lot of clinical studies. They're on onnit.com. You can find the references to all the different things, ingredients, and what they've been proven to do. Uh, I believe in it. I believe in it so much that we have a 100% money-back guarantee in the first 30 pills. Nobody wants anybody to feel ripped off. We're just trying to sell you good shit that we use. So if you're interested, and you go to onnit.com, use the code name Rogan, save yourself 10% off. But as I said, if you have the first 30 pills, 100% money back guarantee. You don't even have to return it. Just say, this isn't for me, and that's it. Our business is done. But we, uh, we hope you will enjoy it. We hope you'll, you'll, uh, it'll enhance your brain, son. Also, we have kettlebells and battle ropes. These are the, the newest uh, additions to onnit.com. If you've never worked out with kettlebells before, don't get crazy in meathead. You really don't need anything more than a 35-pound kettlebell for your first time. And you're like, Joe, you don't even know me. You don't even know how swole I am. 35 pounds? What the fuck am I going to do with that? For real. There's a, there's a video that I use called Extreme Kettlebell Cardio Workout. It's at dragondoor.com. It's can incredible. Can start with a 15? Yes. Or you can start out with a 15. 10. You can do whatever the fuck you want. I start off with a cat. Or you can go crazy and prove me wrong. And use a 50 if you're a fucking savage. But my point is, it's not, uh, it's an incredible workout. It's great for you. And it's great for functional strength, if, you know, moving things, picking things up. Your whole body will work as one unit. That is what kettlebells are designed for. All right, you know what the fuck I'm talking about. Let's, let's get the thing rolling. Hit the, hit the music, Brian. Let's start this thing. Joe Rogan Podcast, check it out. The Joe Rogan Experience. Train by day, Joe Rogan Podcast by night. All day. You're joined today by the world's coolest winemaker. <laughs> What's up, brother? I'm a little nervous because I've never actually met Brian, so I'm kind of... <laughs> yeah, he's a weird motherfucker. <laughs> Trust of, me. Kind of make me nervous. He's going to make you more nervous as time goes on. Is he looking, is he he's, looking at me? He's going to have <laughs> a few comments that are just going to... Oh my God, dude, he's looking at me. <laughs> he looked right at me. He does. He does look at people. It's, it's, <laughs> he doesn't know the effect he has on folks. Um, how the fuck do you go from being a rock star to being a rock star slash winemaker? What was the, it was just a whim? Did you have this idea? Um, I think the biggest, the biggest hurdle that you have to get over is that I don't think I've ever really been a rock star. I've actually dabbled in the rock star stuff, you know, um, a la American Psycho. But uh, for the most part, it was just kind of me putting it on. I've always kind of been a small town kid uh, working in the garden. So you think of yourself as just a human being who likes to do things that are interesting, and this is what's interesting to you now. I just, you know, yeah, I've done things over the years and just get, get inspired and do more things, and then all of a sudden, accidentally along the way somewhere, you, you make a few dollars on, on something, and I just go, oh, great, then I can do more stuff. But so even the way you did this is so uniquely you. You know, you didn't, you didn't do it in Sonoma County. You didn't take an established orchard, orchard rather, and, and, you know, and take over it. You know, you went to a weird place. You went to fucking Arizona. You know, people think of Arizona, you think of kidnappings and, and, and Mexico. And, you know, that's you, th you don't think of... An iced tea. Yeah. You don't think of <laughs> wine yeah. vineyards. Uh, well, uh, historically, almost, almost every state that could actually sustain grapes, uh, uh, vinifera, so uh, European grapes, uh, almost every state had vineyards. In it. Really? Uh, and prohibition just threw a wrench, just a whole monkey wrench in that. And we can go down the whole conspiracy theory regarding... Uh, prohibition? prohibition? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. it's a beautiful one. Yeah. It's, it's real. Uh, it's still working today with marijuana. Yeah. It's and the same, same people. Right. So it's... Uh, so that pretty much what that did is it just interrupted our appreciation for wine uh, as, a, as a daily and part of And it didn't in Europe, and that's why European wines became so much more popular than American wines. Right. Wow. But, they, you know, but they have, they have uh, some places in Europe have had thousands of years to develop what's going on on, their, on that particular spot. They've had like just decades and uh, centuries of notes on weather, on the terrain, on the results, on the process. So they're so far ahead of us in terms of just understanding those things, and it's part of their culture. It's, it, the ground and the soil and what, what minerals and stories, with 
people who have not had any experience in farming might not know, but they vary wildly from place to place. How do you find the right spot if it hasn't had a vineyard there before? Or do you just say, this is a good spot, let's, you know. You, you join the military, you get out of the military, you form a band, you make a million dollars, <laughs> you go dump that million dollars into a fucking black hole in the middle of nowhere, and then go, well, that was the wrong hole, and then you move over here and you dig another hole. How many then, times did you dig? Oh, God. Oh, so you did a few. <laughs> well, there's a couple of sites that just aren't working. Well, we've tried. Bad one. So it's, it's basically you have to like, um, get a printer that can actually print money that looks real. And then just <laughs> keep, make sure you keep changing the cartridges. So did you have to buy new land? Did you, did you uh, lease you a to, place? No, you end up. Well, I mean, uh, you just have to pick the right varietal for that spot. So if you're pretty, if you have a pretty good idea that an area can sustain good grapes uh, that, are, that are going to make you know uh, the kind of wine you want to drink, um, then it's a matter of figuring out what varietal is going to work best there. I mean, we're not trying to grow. We're not trying to grow wine and you know, grow grapes in, in Alaska. That's going to be a hard, you're going to have to really hard press to find the right vine that will actually grow there. Uh, you know, you have Canadian ice wine. You have like a lot of the American hybrids, the, like uh, Vidal Blanc and Norton and those kind of grapes that will grow in that extreme cold temperatures. Uh, not a lot of daylight um, to really f ripen uh, the vinifera. But in our area, we have... Everything is that everything's there. Everything's set up. So it's just a matter of finding in that particular location that you dumped all your money into this land, like it, figure out what grows there. And it's not going to be. It's probably not going to be what you think is going to grow there. It's going to be something else, and it's going to take a lot of trial and error, and you know, forty thousand dollars an acre to find out. So you have to try different grapes, and then go through a full season, and then test the results. Well, yeah, it's it's more like a, it's more like just looking at the soil and uh, and that and that particular terrain and where it is and how it's oriented north, south, east, west, and then try to pick the right grape for that site before you put anything in the ground, figure out what grape might work there. Now, is this a natural resource process for you? Is this something that you knew about already because you were interested no. in it, or did you have to learn all this as you went along? Had to learn, wow. learn the hard way. So, you know, when you put the vine in the ground, you don't know for, well, you might, if it comes, you know, if it sticks around, the next year, well, then you know you're at least you got that part, and you know it actually grew. Then you got to figure out if it's going to get to the point where you can actually train it to start, you know, setting fruit on it. So you're not going to see fruit on that vine. You can probably push it and get some fruit on there the third year, but if you really want quality of fruit, you want to just let the plant really sink in, find its way, get the root system, get the whole structure of it uh, happy and healthy, and then set fruit on it on the fourth year. And then you make the wine out of that fruit in the fourth year, and then get to try it like in its fifth year. So five years down the road after having planted those vines, you go, well, that wine sucks. Oh, no. Man, that's... <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. And there's so no other way you can do that. There's no other, like, high-tech I mean, DNA only, test. Or... Not necessarily. I mean, you know, Predetermined lands, right? Yeah. If you have, a, if you have a, like, if you're in California, you're in Napa Valley, and you've got a vineyard over here and a vineyard over there, you're good. chances are the vineyard right here in the middle is probably going to do okay. And then you'll know what to grow by what everyone around you is growing. Yeah, you have a history. But if you have no history, you're, you know, you're guessing. You're, you're trying to make it work. And, and we're finding now, through trial and error and... You know, many, many dollars later, we're finding that the uh, Italian and Spanish and varietals and Southern Rhone varietals are doing pretty well. What was the motivation to do this in such a, you know, sort of a from the beginning manner? You know, I mean, you you went at it about as, as most difficult path as possible to creating a <clears throat> to creating a wine. Um, it's just it was where I lived, and just having traveled around the world, seeing other regions that kind of re resembled those regions and uh i don't know i kind of i'm the i'm the uh the contrarian you know if you mm -hmm. say one thing i'm gonna go the other way just to to balance things out so just looking at that place i just thought okay let's i have an idea <laughs> you know, looking off your back porch and looking at that land i said i go okay um this sounds like a i want to try this because how many other vineyards are in arizona uh well there's there are now, when I first started, there was about uh, 20, maybe 18 bonded wineries. Now there's about 50. Wow. 
Did so it's, it's you model yourself after them or look at like what soil they're using, whether it's similar to yours? Did you have like, you know, anything no, to go it, on? Not really, no. I mean, yeah, I had a guy from uh, UC Davis come out and uh, kind of chase his tail a little bit and look at it and go, good luck. <laughs> uh, now, do you have to treat the soil in any way? Do you have to mulch not, it or not fertilize necessarily. it? Not necessarily. I mean, you, you, know, you have to make some soil adjustments if, if really needed. But, you know, in a perfect world, you don't do any of that. You just let it be what it's going to be. So, because you want to really express that place um, as much as you can, and you want to you want to help uh, the vines along. If there if there's some nutrient deficiencies as you go, you'll you, you'll notice right away in the vines um, if you're paying attention. But you can also test for it. You know, the little petioles test, like the ends of the vine. You send them in to just see what's in them and what's not in them. So they'll be able to tell you roughly what kind of uh, yeah. wine it'll produce. Uh, no, they'll just let you know whether the plant is healthy. Uh, so whether, whether it needs the, nutrients. Yeah, or so whether or not, I mean, we could plant, uh, like I said, we can plant American hybrids there, and they'll do great. Thrive, look, look awesome, but the wine's crap. You know, you know uh, wine made out of Norton, it's, it's very rare that you have somebody who will impress you with a glass of Norton. I don't even know what Norton is. Exactly. Never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, Manischew, it's, uh, it's uh, equivalent. The first time I ever heard about an area making things taste differently was uh, I had a friend who was really into Cuban cigars. Mm -hmm. told me, uh, you have this uh, Vialto, I forget what the name of this one area of Cuba is, but it's a small area, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's a few hundred acres or something like that. And in that few hundred acres, they produce all the world's Cuban cigars, and it's just whatever is in that soil just mm. make I don't know that much about cigars but I know I've had people hand me okay here's here's three different cigars um, that have the little thingy wrapped off it and mm -hmm. try them out yeah oh I like that one Cuban it's amazing how strong they are it's amazing like what it actually does to you like it's a fucking drug like if you have a good solid cigar like mm -hmm. you're like whoa like I'm high right now mm -hmm. like, this is Let's a go real build drug. something yeah <laughs> you, you get motivated to do things we had a guy in here yesterday, Rob Wolf, who's a nutritionist, who's telling us that uh, creativity is enhanced by nicotine gum. Like, nicotine is actually not bad for you. What's bad for you is all the shit that's in cigarettes. Right. But the nicotine itself, actually, you know, it's a, a, a positive drug. Just hard for us to wrap our heads around. So uh, you, you, you found this spot, and how many years did it take you to you producing what you have here today? You have two wines here today? Yeah. Um these vin uh, this uh, the rosé that I brought. This is the Lely Nebbiolo rosé. This is from our Southern Arizona vineyard that we actually purchased. It was an existing vineyard uh, in, in the Graham County area. It's called Bonita Springs Vineyard. So I've been, you know, with my because I have well three <laughs> three wineries. Uh, Caduceus and American Vineyards are, are my my label. I make these wines, and then Arizona Stronghold is my sister company, and I'm an investor and co-founder of that company. And that company bought these two existing vineyards down in southern Arizona. So there's the Arizona Stronghold Vineyard, Cochise County out of w and Wilcox, and then the Bonita Springs Vineyard in Graham County. So this is most of your focus right now, is making wine? Um, or do you just vary it? Well, when it, uh, when it comes to harvest time, that's, that's where I have to be, because there's, there's no other way around it. It's, that's, you know, I'm, my wife runs the lab, and I make the wine. So when got, is harvest time? Uh, Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so starting Monday, you gather up the grapes, and then start the process of turning them into wine. Yeah, so wow. it's a, it's it'll it'll go on through. You know, we'll see our first uh, we'll see our first whites probably around the first week of August. So uh, I have to basically be back there to just get ready and get everything ready. What is the process, the fermentation process? I know you gather up the wine, or you gather up the grapes rather, you smash them, and then what happens? Uh, depends on depends on how you uh, how you do it. Uh, there's some there's some people that. Uh, you do the harvest, you bring them in, and you actually destem the grapes. You put them into December, and it's kind of like a big tumbler, and the grapes fall through these holes and these little paddles and knock the stems out the end. Uh, and then they'll fall into either a crusher that just kind of pops them and puts them into the bin, and you either pump them into a tank or you put them in a bin and you friend them that way. Or as it's destemmed, you just leave them whole berry, and that's carbonic maceration. So that's more like a, a Pinot Noir process. So they, they produce different results whether they have the stem or not? Uh, I think, uh, personally, my, my choice is I do all my wines, uh, all the reds, I do them uh, carbonic maceration with the whole berry because um, I feel like just in the results when you crush them, sometimes, depending on the region, uh, the, the skins and the stems and the seeds, uh, you know, seeds and, seeds and skins mainly, when you crush them, you actually have more exposure to those kind of like negative tannins, kind of like a green 
uh, tannins and bitter that don't quite, you know, they don't necessarily uh, precipitate out. How did you get involved in all this? Is this something that you've always been fascinated with, or did you just one day get into it and never look back? Um, it's, I think it's, you know, I grew up, you know, working in fruit orchards, and my dad had a garden, and uh, mm. so I think it's just kind of, you can kind of fall into it a little bit, you know. Reluctantly back then, of course, you hate it. You don't want to weed. You don't want to look for the cutworms. You don't want to like do all that stuff. But um, then when you look back on it, you go, actually, that was pretty. That was pretty cool. It was hands-on. You know, when you see what's the food on your table, you know, as a teenager, you don't get it. But later on, you go, we made that. We are, actually aren't you from that. Ohio originally? Originally from Ohio. Yeah, um, I'm and also I, from Ohio I, also. Hmm? I'm also from Ohio, also, and so I also I left. <laughs> you left to go to Michigan. Oh, what? Uh huh. I see what's going on. So Ohio people like and to we stay uh, and, <laughs> and as a you know, just as a as a thank you for letting me leave, but we gave you Detroit. So Detroit is now in northern Ohio. <laughs> right. You're Thanks a lot. That's sweet. <laughs> Bears are moving into Detroit. So can we try some of this stuff? No. I mean, yes. <laughs> Smell it. Yeah. Something. Anything. You can try it. Here, I'll pour you one of these. Do you uh do you still do a lot of uh, art? Because I know you went to college for art, and a lot of your uh, your videos are very art based. Uh, do you per personally do any art still, or uh, or were yeah. you really ever into doing it? I think I was more like the director producer. You know, like I, I was kind of into the the coordinating of getting artists in a room to do things. But uh, as far as the actual talent, mm -hmm. I can't. I can't play piano. I can't play guitar. I can barely draw. How um, did you become a lead singer of a band then? Accidentally. <laughs> uh, I was the loudest asshole in the room. You were the most bold? Uh huh. Mm. I was the guy who thought I had something to say. Well, I, I dug your music, man, but of course, like everybody, but I, I really became a fan when I read this piece that you wrote on Hicks and Gracie. Mm. Where I, uh, you know, you just, you just nailed it. You nailed the whole the the essence of the jiu -jitsu balance article. And yeah, yeah. And Hickson himself was a fascinating guy. What a, he's a, there's very few people that I've met that you, you meet him and like right away you know there's something different about this cat. And uh, Hickson is an incredibly intense guy. It's, it's, it's so rare you find a real martial arts master. Uh, so, sort of a cliche term that we, uh, you know, we think of in, you know, in terms of like movies, the, the one man who is the master, who has it all in control. Well, not to take anything away from Hickson, but I've actually learned more from training with uh, Hoyler. Hoyler's amazing. Yeah, Hoyler and, uh, and Carlos Machado. Because uh, when you travel around, I just, I can't train uh, consistently, so I can't just walk into a dojo and just throw my gi and right. expect not to have my ass handed to me and then not be able to do the show. Right, right, right. So, you know, I just, just do privates, and I just do them with the guys who are as old or older than me, so they don't have anything to prove. So it's just like, hey, let's just have some fun. And uh, rather than trying to put a notch in their belt with my blood. <laughs> well, none of the uh, older guys uh, would do that anyway. The, uh, especially the, I mean, when you get to a black belt level, no one's trying to. No, they're very cool anything. about it. But, you know, I can't just walk into a room and just dive into a class. Yeah. You know, not, at, not at the age of 48 going on 50. Did you used to do that? Did you used to take classes? Yeah, yeah. you know, earlier on, and that's how I got injured. You walk into the wrong place that they think for some reason you're, you know, challenging their manhood, and all of a sudden it's like, Dude, I'm, and at that point, I only weighed like 135, so you're rolling into any, any dojo you're rolling into, you're like, you know, you might as well be somebody's child. The real problem is that uh, blue belt to purple belt stage where you're just trying to get as many kills as you can, mm -hmm. and it's like anyone that comes along, look at this guy, he's only 140 pounds, so that's a kill. I'm going to get this one. I'm, gonna I'm not ignoring guy. you. I'm looking for the photo of Hoyler so I can prove that I actually did that. No, I did. Well, I've, I've, seen seen your, I've seen photos of you and Dave Camarillo and BJ Penn, and uh, I'm sure. This wine, by the way, there delicious. Right. Yeah, what kind is this? There we go. What is this? Is this a rosé? This is a rosé Nebbiolo. There's... There's my Hoyle. Ah, Hoyle Gracie. I just saw him uh, re recently. This is uh, one of his fighters fought in the UFC a couple weeks ago. I don't know if it will show up. Mm. Why not? No. No. A little. You can see his hairline. <laughs> what an incredible family. I want to talk about a, a family that's had an impact on martial arts. It's a, really an amazing thing that in the 1990s, with all we thought we knew about martial arts, this one family from Brazil can have this monstrous impact. Yeah. And it's funny how, like, when now you know that, and do you still see guys pimping their, you know, dance 
theater. Yeah. <laughs> sort of. Much, yeah. much more rare. Square dance. Much more rare than ever before. You know, there's, there's still a few holdouts that are teaching some silly form of something. Yeah, I had a friend who was working with a, a band, and um, he's, you know, a solid practitioner. Uh, finally got his black belt. Um, and, uh, but he just, you know, he does security. He's doing uh, mainly a uh, director of security and, and uh, for these different tours. And this particular one, you know, he wasn't doing any martial arts. He was just like doing his job and uh, directing what was going on. And then one of the artists was um, flying this guy in and paying him all this money to do this kung fu stuff. And, you know, he's being respectful. He's just letting that, like, not my place to even insert into, into that, but like, you know, he's would always like to angle into getting an opportunity on the road. Because when you're traveling, trying to train and trying to do that stuff, it's, it's almost impossible. It's really hard to do. Um, and so, you know, if there's any way he can work into at least getting to train with them, that'd be great. So, you know, whenever the opportunity presented itself, he's like, you know, I, I also, you know, train and do jujitsu. I'd love to jump in with you guys at some point just to get a workout in or something. And the guy basically said, look, if I'm, you know, he wasn't responding to him. So he's like, finally went, look, you know, what we do is like, you know, university level. The, that jujitsu thing is like kindergarten. <laughs> so my buddy's like, okay, it's on. So he calls, he calls Henzo and says, Henzo, I'm on the East Coast. I need a place to go train, and this is what happened. And Henzo's like, what the, bring that motherfucking kung fu motherfucker down to the, it was so amazing that, like, so, you know, this guy is, now he's kind of cornered, he's into, into a, he's kind of basically challenged my friend, and my, fr and my friend's trying to be as respectful as possible, just going, the guy just kept going and going about with, you know, uh, the, yeah. dis the disrespect talk. Well, and that's so, how you know he sucks, most likely. Mm -hmm. It was, and there's a video online of the schooling, and it was, a, oh, really? the video that's online is, it's after, like, it, you know, they started, they did some stuff, and it was over so fast that finally Henzo kept going, okay, now you can't, you can't hit him, you can't, you can't tackle him, you can't use your arm. Like, he kept, like, taking things away from my guy to, like, to make it so that and he was it was, it was him. just destroying him. <laughs> and it was, like, just embarrassing. So the guy who's been paying this guy this money this whole time is looking at this going, what the fuck have I been paying for? Nonsense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of that out there. Square dancing. Well, for the longest time, that was the majority of martial arts was fuckery. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, most of the schools you would find on corners. Right. My friend, my friend Eddie had a guy that he was taking kung fu from, and the guy went to China to learn secret techniques under this <laughs> deadly master. And then he found <laughs> the guy was supposed to be in China. He found his fucking car at the supermarket parking lot, and he found the guy in the suit. Like, what the fuck, man? I thought you were in China. Oh yeah, and yeah. I mean, I'm on my way to China. Trips. Chinatown. Yeah. I was going to Chinatown. It's a, uh, you know, it's it was a secret. A, it was a hustle for a long time. All you had to do was pretend. You just had to like throw some techniques that you learned from. I mean, you could watch a Jean Claude Van Damme movie and kind of get a good idea how he's moving his body and sort of recreate that. Mm -hmm. And if you were really crazy, next thing you know, you could have a school where you're teaching your own style of self-defense that's completely ineffective. I it's, want to do one. that's like a, it's you know, practical fighting where you're actually. You know, you're going to be in a bar, so you might as well be drunk. So we call it just beer sando. And you just show up and you immediately pound a six pack and then we start training. <laughs> That's a good idea. Brian, we got to throw your chair away. I know. It's dead. I think it's Why don't you grab one of these other ones? All right. These other ones that don't get used as much, don't squeak as much. Yeah. Um, I thought that this, was his back. No. But imagine if it was. That would be... Uh, that would be one of the worst feelings ever if you've dedicated a massive amount of your life to some bullshit and mm -hmm. then it's just exposed in front of you like that. Right. That happens to a lot of martial artists, man. I've met a lot of people who, you know, whether it was Taekwondo or whatever traditional martial art that had a, a giant hole in it, and they didn't even realize that. Well, it was the same with my friend. He was like, he was a black belt in, in uh, I think, Taekwondo, and he, won he rolled into uh, uh, um, uh, <coughs> Rodrigo Baji's place in St. Louis and went, okay, you know, whatever this is, let me just show you. <laughs> and he just had his ass handed to him, like, repeatedly. And he went, okay, I'm sold. <laughs> yeah, I was a black belt in Taekwondo before I ever did Jiu-Jitsu. And when I first did Jiu-Jitsu, there was this kid that I'll never forget, this purple belt kid, my age, my size, there's nothing special about him. And he used to just maul me. 
every class he would maul me it was like i was a baby like i couldn't do anything to him i couldn't defend myself mm. i'd be exhausted he'd just fucking strangle me and i'd have to tap it was just so humiliating and, and humbling you know i remember thinking wow i was walking around not even knowing somebody my size could do that to me mm. i had no idea Really had no idea. I was living in a completely delusional world of martial arts prowess. Well, you have to remember that we, prowess. the reason that we're uh, here at all is at some point during our human development, we, you know, in, instinctively and just accidentally realized that we can't rely on our strength or speed. We had to rely on our brain. So, because, you know, we don't just run out and grab the line and rip its head off. We had to run from it and find a stick and sharpen it and you know, go out in teams and, you know, take down the elephant with five guys, you know, so that, you know, so when you think of martial arts in that manner, you start to realize how important the mental game is as opposed to just the physical game. Well, especially in jiu-jitsu, it's one of the rare martial arts where technique is really the most important aspect of, of, of the practice. And when you get a really big, strong guy, it's actually a disadvantage for a strong guy to learn jiu-jitsu because the best technical guys are always small, weaker guys because they have to be technical. Mm -hmm. There's nothing they can muscle or force. Whereas the big guys, they can get away with some sloppy shit because of the fact that they're big and strong. So mm -hmm. they're really hindering themselves by using strength. I mean, that's, there's no sport like that and no martial art even like that. I mean, technique is very important in kickboxing, but Athleticism and speed is equally important. You know, if mm -hmm. you're if you're very technical but slow, it really won't work. In mm -hmm. jujitsu, these guys, the, the the saddest thing about rolling with someone like a Hickson or a Jean Jacques Machado is like they don't even try. Like it's not like they're straining and moving hard. They just slowly. Oh my friend, <laughs> oh you're on your back again. Oh you better protect this arm because this is the one I'm going Ten, for. Yeah. Nine, eight, yeah. seven. You're like, what's he gonna yeah. do? <laughs> and then he does it, and you go, okay. Hickson would do that to black belts. He would pick an arm and tell them, "I'm gonna get your right arm in an arm bar." And you're like, there's no fucking way. I'm just going to chicken wing this motherfucker. My arm's over there. Like, how are you going to get me in an arm bar? And all of a sudden he's over there and you're tapping out. Yeah, it's, I didn't know that there was something like that before. And when you, once you understand like, how technical jiu-jitsu is, it really becomes so fascinating. Josh Waitzkin is a, a famous uh, chess player. He was that movie Searching for Bobby Fischer was mm -hmm. based on him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, sort of got disillusioned with chess after I got bored with it and devoted the same energy to jiu-jitsu. And he's one of Marcelo Garcia's protégés okay. now. And he has, I think it's called uh, M MGJ and Marcelo Garcia Jiu-Jitsu in Action. MGJ in Action dot com. And um, it's may maybe MGJJ. Um, and it's um, the, the website, he has it broken down the way you would break down chess. Like he breaks down moves and has different, you know, different transitions, different moves. So you can look at it you know, in a much more maybe analytical and, you know, uh, calculated move, move way, you know, okay. than, than you would if you were What's just his name? a... His name is Josh Waitzkin. Okay. Yeah. There's a guy that, were, uh, that uh, works, trains out of uh, Henzo Studio in New York. Mm -hmm. I think his name's John. John Donaher, maybe? God, yeah, he's a beast. And it's just like, it's, it's like, mm -hmm. like the chess. You watch yeah. his brain going, okay, this is this, is this millimeter. And this well, is this he was millimeter. A, a philosophy student. Mm -hmm. He was a, a, a university student, and uh, he was bouncing. That's what he was doing for fun, you know, or to, to pay bills. And along the way, someone said, hey, you should learn some jiu-jitsu, and he became completely obsessed. Mm -hmm. Sleeps on the mats. I mean, literally teaches all day. <laughs> I mean, Donaher is a legend um, in jiu-jitsu circles. He's a... It's what happens when a super intelligent guy gets physically absorbed in the sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's just uh, he's he works with a lot of top guys. Like he's uh, always in uh, George St. Pierre's corner. Mm -hmm. He's uh, there's a lot of good guys that come out of his gym. And there's guys who give good instruction, and there's guys who suck in the corner. And in the corner, there's some guys who just you listen to them, and I have to do everything I can and not cri criticize them. Like, what the fuck are you saying to that guy? Like this is nonsense. Like. You don't hit him. You're better off saying nothing because you're just you're you're putting in like an air of despair and idiocy into this into this cage. They say such stupid shit, but not Donaher, man. Donaher is like super precise. You need to hold your left hand slightly higher. Your chin tucked, <laughs> shoulders up. Move to your right side. If he's throwing the left, first duck under, then go for a single. The single does not work. You transition to a double. Have water. Drink. <laughs> Deep breath. And you're like, whoa. 
this motherfucker just got schooled. Yeah. You know, you hear him talk, and you, you know, this guy knows exactly what I'm supposed to do. If I could just listen to this guy, I think I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. It's a crazy world, the world of uh, intelligence and, and risk in martial art. And that's what, it, what, you know, people, like, for the wrong reasons, associate martial arts and especially associate competition with meatheads, assholes, dummies. But the most brilliant minds and some of the most interesting people that I've ever met were martial arts practitioners because there's a certain amount of calculation you have to do while under extreme duress and pressure and there's a risk involved and mm -hmm. the risk is like physical health and all of those together create an incredible reward when you're successful the, the reward is amazing but the downside is like man for most people the, the down is too low and they avoid it mm -hmm. and that's the people that can can make their way through those waters the, the strongest salmon who get up that waterfall are, to me some of the most interesting people that I've ever met yeah I would have to agree yeah, and that's what I got out of your article. I was like, this guy gets it. He's, you're, you're seeing the, the essence of, uh, of what this is all about. How long have you been doing jiu-jitsu now? Uh, I started in the mid to late 90s. Uh, I got injured right around 2000, and I've only done it you know, on and off now whenever I can. When you're, when you're doing your wines, it must be like 16 hours a day. I mean, you must be. Uh, well, right? you know, I'm pretty... I'm, I'm pretty organized, so I, you know, I make sure that whatever I can, whatever I can bring to the table as far as making things easier and smoother and, and not getting in my own way. Like just a lot of logistics and understanding. Like if I do this, I'm gonna have to undo this in five moves. So I always like I've laid things out in a manner that you know I'm in the winery around 6 a.m. 6:30. But I'm wrapping it up around, you know, 8 o'clock. So you're a black belt in winemaking is what you're trying to say. I'm a black belt in logistics. Black belt in logistics. Yeah, just understanding the process and not getting in my own way. And then when you go from that mode into musician mode, do you just do it on, based on your schedule? Like whenever your time becomes free, you go, okay, you know, starting in yeah, yeah, it's October all, it, or whatever. There's a little bit more emotion, a little bit more... Uh, the randomness of with that with that you know you kind of have to kind of ride those waves a little bit but in a way when you have enough time under your belt you can kind of force uh the situation you can you know a lot of times i just get in my my truck and i got a decent stereo in the truck and i got the tracks and i just that way nobody can mess with me i can't get a phone call nobody's knocking on the door i just go park somewhere and turn the music up with a notepad and start writing because nobody now you're in your world if you're my if i'm in my house you know, the phone's going to ring. I'm going to check my email. I'm going right. to ask a question or, you know, mail's in, you know, oh, is that Super Troopers on HBO again? <laughs> and so, so much for writing. Yeah, that's why I write when everyone's asleep. I don't, I don't even start until 11 p.m., 12 mm -hmm. p.m. Everyone in my house has to be asleep. I, I like it when people around me are asleep, too. I like to think the neighbors are asleep. I like to think that I'm not picking up any weird vibes from anybody. Right. Everybody's right. in Z zone. Right. You know, but do you, um, when you, when you write, do you have like specific times where you set aside time to write or you just try to do it whenever the creative yeah, whim? The whim, you know, just kind of do it, you know, it'll be like focused periods of time. Like I'm going to, this week is going to be dedicated to, and, and same thing with training. Uh, if I'm going to train or if I'm going to uh, be doing jujitsu, I'm going to do any of that stuff. I will hire somebody to be there. Mm hmm because now I have to do it. Right. So if I have friends that were, you know, musician friends, they've flown out, we're going to write this week. Okay, I'm in my truck. I'm over here. I'm going to come in and we're going to track some stuff that didn't work back to the truck. Why Arizona? That's where I live. Just always lived there? I, I moved there in 95. Really? Yep. Why 95? Uh, I hate L.A. I hate your town. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's not mine, but I don't like it either. Yeah, I, I tried know. to escape... I, I, for I moved while. here in uh, basically December of 89, so, you know, basically 1990, January. And uh, it just, it only took a little bit of time. I mean, I got, don't get me wrong, I got a lot out of this town. Uh, things, you know, odd things happened for me. Um, you know, just uh, kind of, you know, set the ball in motion. I mean, there's, you know, I was doing a lot of things with my life before I moved to L.A. Um, and there's a lot of uh, achievements and things that I'd, that I'd kind of uh, done for myself and, uh, but then it wasn't until I was actually in L.A. in a band where somebody was profiting on my decision-making that you actually heard about me. So, you know, there's a lot of things that I was kind of doing before I got here. And then I fell into the band thing, and that kind of got popular. And uh, that was why I actually stuck here 
for as long as I did because I just within like a couple of years I was like this is not for me I don't I need to be in a small town when it got to a certain point well, you, of you, the fame of Tool you could pretty much have done whatever you wanted to anyway because you're mostly just touring and you just had to be around the people when you were rehearsing and preparing right kind of yeah I think a little bit more hands on than that but uh, yeah for the most part uh, that was that was the case but you know and then you know in the from 95 to 2000, I kind of bounced back and forth a little bit from Arizona to here just because of the work. You know, you have to, when you're recording and doing stuff, you have to kind of be there for, and you're right, you're on the road for pretty much. And that, in, in those days, it was easily six months out of the year you're traveling. But of course, you're younger and you can handle it. Now, the the area you're at is like, that's like a haunted Wild West town, right? Mm, it's an old mine, it's an old copper mining town. Uh, it's like a billion dollar copper mine. It had this huge ore body underneath this side of this hill. A uh, billion dollars worth of copper. And that was like, you know, 1920s, 1930s billions. So it was, a, it was a huge ore body, like big enough to put a cathedral in, the hole in the ground that they took all the copper out. And did you just pick this area because it just seemed like an interesting area? Or you, no. you like the vibe of it? No, I, I, mean, I had a dream. I was supposed to be out of fucking L.A., you had a dream. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just kept having this recurring dream, and it's like a, like, you know, it was, it was very specific images and place, and, uh, I, you know, for some reason I thought it was Arizona. And uh, I remember talking to Hicks about it, like going, I think, I think I'm supposed to be in Arizona. And uh, I mentioned it to Tim Alexander, and, you know, I said, I've been to Phoenix, I'm not, I'm not having it. Um, and I described the dream, and Tim went, oh, I know where that is. So yeah, because he's from he's from Arizona, and so he went, okay, I'll, I have to take you someplace. We drove up there and like rolling into that valley, just going, holy shit, this is the place. Wow. And then I got up to the town, and it's like, no shit. Do and you then, interact with the townsfolks? Because th to me, that's the hardest thing about moving to anywhere. It's you got to find cool people. Either I am the, I am the absolute troublemaker in that town. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know they. You know, it's a, it was an old mining town. It kind of, they, they kind of turned, uh, a lot of that went away. It's like 20,000 people in this town at one point were like working the mine, like in, in the Clarkdale area, in the Cottonwood area, and, and, and Jerome area working this mine. And, you know, when it, uh, when it dried up and you know, there was the Depression and World War I and doing all that kind of stuff, it kind of shut down. It dropped down to like, you know, 30 people in this small town. Whoa. And then, of course, you know, the 70s, 60s, 70s, so the draft dodgers and the people that just wanted to do what they wanted to do uh, moved into this basically an abandoned town. Are you anywhere near Bisbee? No. Uh, I'm not sure where Bisbee is, but it's not, I think it's more on the, on the edge of the state somewhere. But similar, it's a very weird mind. But a very time. similar, very similar scenario. So, you know, the trust fund babies and the hippies moved in and uh, kind of took over the town and uh, they're, for the, you know, for the most part, the people that moved into the town are not the kind of people that built the town, not the kind of visionaries that came in and went, I think there's copper under this thing, and then did all this stuff. I'm more like those people, and so I'm kind of the enemy because I do stuff, I, you know, heaven forbid. Um, so how are you a troublemaker in the town, though? Because I don't want, they, you know, they fear change, and, you know, we came here to retire and, and not do anything. Well, you make too much noise, you're too just, strange. I just stuff, I'm just doing stuff, I'm bringing... <laughs> By, you know, by discovering uh, the terroir there and making wine there, I'm bringing people to town. You're what? You're bringing people. I mean, we don't need people in town. So how the hell are they going to pay for your pipes and your electric? And like, how are you going to make your streets be safe? You need, it's a municipality, not a camping ground. You need, <laughs> you need funding. You need tax dollars to fix your thing. You know, the best way to really fix your town is if you have something that's unique to your town, an export, if you will. I found it. How dare I? So you're doing well for the town, and they just don't like anything moving or anyone to make them feel. There's a handful of people that are like the hand, There's a handful of people that are basically their their mo is to just lay in the street, and if you can move them, okay, then you can kind of go down the street. But if you can't move them, you give up, they win, and you just kind of tail tail between your legs and you leave. I don't. I don't know how to move stuff. That's my problem with L.A. is that L.A. is where my friends are. And if I had to move to another place, I'd have to deal with a bunch of fucking people and all mm -hmm. their nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you bring everybody with you. Which is also a, start a, compound. a good, yeah, 
get all crash on it. Do you have friends out in Jerome? Oh, yeah, you, absolutely. Did you, did yeah. you have them Good already? Did you? No, you know, you ma I made a lot of friends. There's some really, really awesome artists in that town, like really good people. And they all mean well. Like, don't get me wrong. All of, every single person in the town means well, and uh, they're all good people. But, you know, that's just personalities and small town politics. That's the way it is. But still better than the insane uh, buzz of this hive. This fucking oh, yeah, yeah. thirty million people oh, yeah. high. I, I much prefer the conflict that we, that we have with our with our people in, in Jerome over whatever the hell it was that went over there on the five and the th one thirty four today. <laughs> hey, we just decided to shut this ramp down. Well, have you ever flown in to LAX and you see the four hundred five and you see literally seven, eight, nine, ten miles of stopped cars and you crawl into your overhead bin and hope <sighs> that they just let you go back to Tokyo? It's just like, what the fuck is that? This is craziness. <laughs> this is just we're just banking on nothing going wrong ever in a place where yeah, the Earth moves. Yeah. Yet here I am, like an idiot. I'm trying to get out. I'm, I'm working on it right now. Okay. I'm working on my next move. Any, I tried, mi any minute now. I tried Colorado for a little bit. <laughs> it's a long story. But uh, my dog got eaten by a mountain lion. I came back. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Colorado's a weird one. Like, you go to Denver, and there's that area where almost everybody's missing an eye, an arm, or in a wheelchair, <laughs> or a walker. It's like a weird, like, like a Twin Peaks, but, like, on steroids area. And you kind of go... We have, would have contests. Like, okay, we're here for 24 hours. Whoever see, can count the most wheelchairs and... and you know, three points for a wheelchair, one point for like a missing arm. Maybe people coming back to like, you know, the sound check going, I got 40 points. Really? What area of Denver is this? It's right on that 16th Street uh, promenade area, uh, right there in the, in, in the center of town there. It's insane. You, it's, you're, you're, you're there for, if you're there for longer than 12 hours, you start going, what's going on here? <laughs> is, there some kind of, is there like a, you know, are they testing out these things? Are, they, are these people actually in them? Are I've never them? noticed. I, I picked Denver because it's got a strong medical marijuana community. And this, once you get used to the way they have it set up in L.A., mm -hmm. you, just, you can't deal with the nonsense of dealing with drug dealers. It's just, it just becomes so stupid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Denver is set up pretty much exactly like L.A. is. Denver and Boulder. There's places everywhere. They have a, a th I think they call it Broadsterdam. And they have one area where it's, uh, I think it's Broadway, where there's like, you know, bakery shops mm -hmm. and, you know, the whole deal. It's got a good, they have like a sensible liberal vibe, you know, Denver. And, you know, Boulder's a little bit more radical, but Denver has like a sensible, open-minded vibe. Like, mm -hmm. they support guns and they support hunting and they support outdoors activities. But they're also in favor of gay marriage and they're also in favor of not discriminating. And, you know, so it's, it's a very interesting, so that's why I picked it, but... Arizona always scared me, man. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a scary place when, in terms of all those things you just mentioned. But I think it's I think all that stuff's kind of changing there because you can't have something that's so far one way and not have a pushback and yeah. have a, and have a and have a community that's just the complete polar opposite. And it's absolutely there. So eventually, it'll just kind of come around. The the idea of living in cities, I think, is one day not going to be necessary anymore. I think we needed it because everybody had to be on top of everybody because that's where you worked and, you know, in order to communicate with everybody. But now because of the Internet, I think uh, there's a lot of people's jobs that don't have to be in, in the swarm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of – there's definitely a lot of just change in general happening with uh, just the way we think about stuff. And um, I don't know about you, but I've had like a – had a week there about two months ago where it's just everything just seemed like the gyroscopes were off and I couldn't I couldn't get anything right it was like I'd forgotten how to do the most simple things you know like you know not not the perfect example like you know walk outside to change a tire and I've got like a carrot and a you know <laughs> a candle like okay what do you I think it was a cycle, like a vibe? No, or? I think I think it's I still kind of feel a little bit but I was and I was I kind of called a friend who uh, she's uh, She's as crazy as I am. Really, she's like, uh, she does uh, Kundalini yoga. You know, like she wakes up at 4 a.m. and to watch mm. the sun rise and do the breath of fire. And so she's, you know, either she's a complete kook and I'm and I drank the Kool Aid or or we're onto something here. But uh, you know, she she says it's you know funny you should ask that because uh, that's kind of what we're what she's seeing um, in her world. How everything's just, uh, you know the gyroscopes are just kind of off and. Uh, and the biggest, I think the biggest thing she was suggesting, and I've done some reading on it as well, is like it's just more a matter of uh, paying attention, um, not letting it get to you, uh, not being like all, you know, Tony Robbins and get all, you know, positive, grinny guy, but, uh, you know, just like know that it's all going to work out 
and don't let the petty shit get you down. Don't let the the dark stuff sink in because it's almost like you're in a record groove. You're in the light groove. And if you let if you flop over to the dark groove, you kind of get stuck in that groove and it's kind of a downward spiral. So, so one thing that I found it's most difficult to deal with when you deal with a large city or a large population is you are you're constantly getting other people's energy in there. It's sometimes hard to dictate your own path. Mm -hmm. your, and that's what own, she was saying. She's yeah. like in a way you have to kind of just not hang out out of fear just kind of settle in calmly and just like we're talking about with the jujitsu the guy's big and he's strong and he's got technique but you just have to take a deep breath and and some level know that one way or another it's all going to work out Those kundalini yoga people are fascinating uh, a buddy of mine has a, a friend who does the same thing every morning she does the breath of fire and she claims to achieve psychedelic states Mm -hmm. She says that uh, because of all her years of practice, she can, it's just like as if she's taking heavy drugs. Mm -hmm. She goes to other worlds and communicates with uh, entities and, you know, and has what, what she describes as indescribable experiences. She said, if I told you what I could do just with my own uh, breath exercises and kundalini yoga, you wouldn't believe me. Right. And, you know, most of my friends that are in, into that stuff, into that deep, they don't talk about it just yeah. because it's, it's, a, it's such an individual experience. And, uh, and I had another friend who, you know, with similar uh, similar path and you know she kind of grew up in the in the 60s and everybody's doing you know doing acid and stuff and uh, she had mentioned that you know it was kind of it was cool for the the jump start for people to kind of get into that consciousness and, and be thinking on that level but at the same time they didn't really do the work to get there so they really didn't understand what it was they were experiencing so in a way she called it spiritual theft you're like, you know, all of a sudden you're just right in the middle of this thing, but you don't really have any business being there. Right. You can't really process what it is that you're experiencing. Recreational mushroom trips. Yeah. And so, yeah. It's, so you're like, here you are. And then, you know, for most people, that just, that's, <laughs> it lights out for them. They're going to be a little marred for the rest <coughs> of their lives. But, and you know, I kind of agree with that. I think that some of the work, taking that time and, and really taking your time getting to those states or in just in your life in general and doing anything, um, I mean, it's, it's really difficult for most people these days because they want what they want when they want it because yeah. they're so used to getting whatever the fuck it is they want when they want it. And to when they don't get it, they lose their shit. Yeah, which is exactly opposite of the psychedelic experience, what it would teach you. I think um, the, the approach is so important, and doing the work and saying doing the work is so important because you're treating whatever this experience is, is going to be with a, a deep amount of respect. Mm -hmm. And unless you do that, you know, I, I don't think you're you're really going to get the most out of it. I mean, if you just go into it and try to just uh, let it cure you or let it figure you out or let it, you're just going to be too blown away with the whole thing to really absorb any of it. Right. You, you, doing the work and like one of the things that I, I really appreciated about the people that really get into Kundalini yoga is they all seem legit. I, I haven't met anybody who claims these psychedelic states who who doesn't really seem like a humble person. It really seem like and there's never any weird ego shit or, mm -hmm. you know, weird uh, trace of bullshit. It's, it seems like this This is just what they do. And they'll, they'll talk to you about it and they'll describe it to you. But they say it's not about the, it's not about the psychedelic state of it. It's mm -hmm. all about just like a, sort of a... Uh, just no, a it's about knowing life. that it's going to go, knowing that it's all going to work out. Yeah. You know, and we might not even be included in this form that we're in and how it's going to work out. And if you can let go of the fear of worrying about whether that's going to happen or not, as soon as you can just let go of that fear and just, you know, let go. Just appreciate what off. is. Appreciate yeah. what is. Don't worry about what can, what would, what may. Appreciate what is mm -hmm. and know that even if it doesn't work out, it's going to work out. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's all works out, even if it doesn't work out. Exactly. It's too hard for us to wrap our heads around how big the whole picture is. You know, when you realize that, you know what is the um, the uh, the Woodstock song? We are stardust. We are golden. We are billion-year-old carbon. Well, we we really are fucking. Joni Mitchell. Yeah, Joni Mitchell and who was the, the Crosby, Stills. They, they covered it. Yeah. They covered it. Is that, that what it was? That's her song. Yeah. Brilliant song. And it's so true. This is the the thing that people don't understand. A human being is actually made because a star burns out, explodes. And th it has to happen. If yeah. it doesn't happen, you don't make those materials, right. and human life, carbon-based life forms, don't, don't don't exist. So, even if it doesn't work out, it works out. Right. It but you know, you can understand in our in the state that we're in, and you know, this this real tactical, you know, <laughs> tactical, uh, 
tactile uh, existence that we live, you know, you get caught up with the game. You know, you kind of get into the fear. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, that's part of it. Super so easy. That, so it's okay, you know. But uh, every now and then you get kind of wrapped up in it. And uh, I remember, like, last week, uh, the same guy, the jujitsu guy that I was telling you about, uh, Todd, he, uh, he's, he's just out of the blue texting me. He's like, so, man, how's it going? Like, it's almost like intuition. Like, how's it going? Like, funny you should ask. It's, just, it's been a shit storm the whole week. He goes, oh, well, let me just give you this. And he sent me this. I hope I brought it. He sent me this thing. I ended up forwarding it to a bunch of people because I knew a bunch of other people were going through some weird shit. And uh, may I? Sure, please. So live your life that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about their religion. Respect others in their view and demand that they respect yours. Love your life. Perfect your life beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and its purpose in the service of your people. Prepare a noble death song for the day when you go over to the great divide. Always give a word or a sign of salute when meeting a, or passing a friend, even a stranger, when in a lonely place. Show respect to all people and grovel to none. When you arise in the morning, give thanks for the food and for the joy of living. If you see no reason for giving thanks, the fault lies only in yourself. Uh, abuse no one and no thing, for abuse turns the wise ones into fools and robs the spirit of its vision. When it comes your time to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with fear and death, so that their time comes, they weep, they pray for more little time, and live their lives again over and over in a different way. Instead, sing your death song and die like a hero going home. That's fucking beautiful. Yeah, so awesome. I'm like, so of course all my friends are like, well, you know, who wrote that? So I had to go back to him and go, where'd you get that? He goes, a homeless dude gave it to me. Wow. <laughs> it's Jesus. <laughs> it's like, please don't say it's L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta, <laughs> that, would be, that would be my luck. Like, oh, you know, Adolf Hitler. You know? Well, it sounds like I believe. I <laughs> but agree it actually, with it's, uh, I, I actually found it online, and it's um, uh, Chief Tecumseh. Crouching Tiger from the uh, from the Shawnee Nation. Uh, Whoa. He, he died in 1813. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That makes it even more cool because I thought it was some new age douchebag mm -hmm. probably pilfered from, some stuff off the internet and pieced it together. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Yeah. Wow. I agree with everything he said except for making fun of religion. <laughs> <laughs> you go, girl. Other than that, he's got me. <laughs> I think religion has to be made fun of because if you, you know, look, if you can't make fun of things that are ridiculous, you're missing out on a big part of what's fun about this life. And religion's ridiculous. Respect it, but make fun of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, I'm down. I'm down with the Shawnee Warriors. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was great that he, you know, he said, ah, some homeless dude. Well, we lost, <laughs> we lost such a massive chunk of what those people had learned about living like this life of nomadic life of following animals and you know following following herds of buffalo around and and learning about the connection between I mean you got to think about the 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 deep respect native americans had for the animals that they killed and you know it's it's such a an interesting way of life they they kept up for so long while most of the western world had already moved on to you know riding horses and kingdoms and houses and agriculture and these people were just traveling around and, and living off the land mm -hmm. so it's so much wisdom we could have learned from those people and it was wiped out it's a it's it's a weird time when you think about that just that was just a couple of hundred years ago a blip in human civilization and there was these nomadic people you know living in this area i remember watching uh i went to movies with uh, my son it was a few years ago and it was that uh black stallion movie <laughs> uh, it's you know some animation and when, and it was pretty. I'm just kind of sitting in the theater, just kind of. It kind of dawned on me, and I'm kind of like, you know, <laughs> like the the curmudgeon with his son, like you know my kid just going, can you just enjoy the movie, please? <laughs> but I'm looking at it going, this whole movie is based on this exhilarating feeling of like this black horse and this guy kind of stopping the white man from moving west. And it's like, but I'm watching the fucking movie in Los Angeles. It didn't <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs> and my son's just like, will you let it go and just enjoy this stupid movie and get me more popcorn, please? That's funny. Yeah, it's like you root against us. <laughs> I mean, that's what Avatar is. Yeah. I mean, Avatar is You don't think they're coming back? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. 
Yeah, that was the first ship. Unobtainium? That was worth <laughs> billions of dollars? I think Obtainium. And we're coming back and we're going to obtain it. I mean, that was the Santa Maria, right? The, the Avatar <laughs> ship. That yeah. was the beginning of the first yeah. wave of no. the fuckers. Yeah. <laughs> Um, can I try the other stuff? What, do you, what is your yeah? Uh, this your is red? the this is the Shinola. I'm really a red wine guy. That's yeah. what I enjoy. But I uh, I love that rosé. It's delicious. This is a this is a special drop. Um, we had we got hit with frost really hard in uh, early 2011, so we didn't have a lot of Arizona fruit in our vineyards to work with. So I panicked and I uh, is this one yours? Here we go. Yeah. Uh, and I source some fruit from right over the border from our, our vineyards right down on the, on the border uh, you know, on the 10 as you're heading toward New Mexico. It's in Wilcox in that area. So right over that border, like another hour or so just past Wilcox is a New Mexico vineyard. And this guy's out there, great grower. He's got all these fantastic Italian varietals growing there. And there, you know, there's a historic, it's a pretty old vineyard there. So I picked these, uh, all these grapes up for uh, not much and I uh, did this blend. It's Sangiovese, Dolcetto, Rafasco, and Primitivo. So it's a straight up Italian blend. It's uh, delicious. From New Mexico grapes. And uh, it's. What do you call it? Shinola. <laughs> Come on. Is that your own name? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no I mean, you know, it's a. Is that a type of wine? An a, actual type of no, wine? No, it's a, it's a reference to uh, the jerk. The shit from Shinola? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Recognize. Um, y yeah, New Mexico is a, a fascinating oh. area. You know, I think uh, that's where Val Kilmer went and grew his head. That's where <laughs> <laughs> I was watching. It's a magical space. It's a, I was watching The Ghost in the Darkness the other day, <laughs> and I was like, there's a funny fucking internet meme where it's Val Kilmer at his most bloated, and it says, remember when I was Batman? LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Val Kilmer moved to, uh, to uh, New Mexico and just bought a ranch and just grew his head. Yeah. Just, I don't know what the fuck happened, but in this ghost in the darkness, I'm like, Jesus Christ, I was a handsome man. Yeah. And it was stunning. I mean, yeah. so, some just decided, you know, I like pills better. And just moved to New Does Mexico. That, he did that movie a couple years ago with uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, what was that crazy movie? He shrunk a little. Yeah, he shrunk He's a little. He's got it under control. Yeah. yeah, it seems like you realize that was like, actually what a fun fuck movie. am I doing? I kind of liked it. Yeah, it was a fun movie. I don't remember what it was, though. What yeah. the hell was it called? It was some sort of a... It involved letters yeah. and, and arranged in a certain order, and I can't remember any of them. Yeah, they all get blurry after a while. <laughs> um, you became buddies with uh, one of my biggest influences and one of my biggest idols is Hicks. Mm. How did you, uh, how'd you meet him? How'd that go down? Uh, well, you know, as, as, as you do, you kind of just, somebody can hand you a cassette back in the day it's it's a cassette it's a it's a tape yeah. recording <laughs> and it goes around and around yeah. um uh, you know right around the same time as uh atrax uh, but he got the cassette of one of his, his two first uh releases and uh on the on the road just like you know absorbing all this stuff and then eventually we uh when we put out another record we basically thanked him on it and uh sent him a copy of the record and he reached out and then we just kind of hit it off and we hit out all these plans this is back, you know, earlier, uh, earlier tool days. So, um, you know, we had all these plans that we wanted to kind of do something with him. And uh, we were, you know, we were still kind of a young band. So this is like 93, 94. And uh, we were going to do a tour together. And uh, then he got sick. It's like kind of, oh, you know, plans right out the window. Kind of suck. Right, right when the time was, we were small enough where we could still, we could actually do a comedy tour, you know, with a, a comedian and, and a rock band. Uh, as soon as it was, you know, a year later, that was things kind of blew up a little bit, and it would have been. Yeah, you know, I mean, for example, we played several shows in the in the California area where uh, Tenacious D opened for us, but we were a big enough band where people in the audience were just like, "Get this shit off the stage!" You're like throwing shit at them. And we had like, we've had like David Cross and uh, Greg Barrett do stuff in front of our uh, a show to open the thing, and just getting pelted with stuff. Now, you know, that wouldn't happen now because they know who they are, but... It was know, still happening. It was tenacious. <laughs> it was still D, happening. dude. Yeah, I know. People are brutal, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of challenges um, growing up, and then all of a sudden, when I was actually away from uh, all of the stuff that I was familiar with, the people that were familiar with me, it was nice to be able to be in a setting where uh, I was actually excelling and achieving things anonymously 
you know, there was things that were happening that all of a sudden I was shining in a way, but not, uh, you know, none of my people back in where I was from knew anything about it, uh, but I was doing really well. The discipline and resolve in doing any difficult endeavor is so important for a young man, you know, and it's one of the sort of themes we've brought up on this podcast many times is that there's, there's no coming of age rituals in our culture anymore. Mm -hmm. And there's a re I always thought they were retarded when I was young. Like, you know, what are these fucking idiots hanging themselves by their tits and, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, bu putting their hands in uh, bullet ant, you know, uh, bins. Like, what the fuck is wrong with these people? Why would they? Yeah. Like, I'm 18. I'm a man. Done. No. No, really. You really need to go through something. You need yeah. to, you need to, you know, you need to have, uh, that's why so many cultures have either psychedelic experiences that, you know, young people go through or with, we talked about this yesterday, ordeal poisons where it's, it's not a psychedelic because there's none in their area. So they take something that almost kills them. Mm -hmm. And then when it's over, they're just so happy to be healthy again and alive that they sort of realize they've gone through a tunnel. They've made it through a passage. Right. They've, they've reached an actual new level. And mm -hmm. it, we're missing that, man. We, we get out of fucking high school and then we're just lost. We're mm -hmm. panicking, completely right. terrified. We're going to starve to death. It's clinging on to the first job or the first opportunity for some sort of security that we can. You know, uh, the, the only good thing that I could ever think about having sort of some sort of a mandatory military uh, experience for most United States citizens is two, twofold. One, so people can understand what the fuck the military is really all about instead right. of this nonsense, rah, rah, chicken hawk bullshit where mm -hmm. people support this idea of sending our fucking trained killers to these places where we don't know anybody and fucking them up in the name of justice or whatever the fuck it is. We right. would get a better idea of what that is and it would be harder to pull the wool over people's eyes because right. it's so easy for all these people that will have nothing to do with shooting anybody ever to say, we support the troops and support, you're our heroes and you're the reason why we could be free Free and nonsensical statements that mean the reason why that shit flies is because we got a nice blanket, this blanket of security, the USA, whatever the fuck it is, throw it over your head. You don't, you don't really have to think about the actual horrors of military. Mm -hmm. If we forced people to join, and I'm not saying we should, but the, the only benefit that we would get out of that is that people would kind of get an idea of what reality really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, uh, there, and there is that fine line. You, there's no way to really kind of you know, to really be able to direct that experience, it really is an individual, an ind individual thing. There's going to be people that figure out a way to make that work for them in terms of being lazy. Um, I got out of shape in the army when I got when I went in. Really? You know, it's just because back <laughs> when I you went hustled in, the system. When, when, when they when they when I went in, they uh, they wanted people in, so they weren't really you know pushing people too hard. And it was in a period of time when we didn't have a lot of obvious conflict going on, so. It seemed like everything had sorted itself out, and why am I going to the military other than just getting a college fund out of it and then fucking off? Uh, but, you know, so they were kind of like, kind of lowered the standard a little bit to kind of get more people in. Uh, I think that was a mistake, but, you know, I, I still learned a lot about it. What year it, was know. this? This is from 82 to 85. I came real close to joining in '85 when I got out of high school. It was a, they had an army taekwondo team. They would uh, you would get a shitty easy desk job, but they would pay you to train and they'd mm -hmm. give you. Uh, they told you they were going to pay you to train. See what yeah. they did? They did the bait and switch with me too. Like, oh, you want to be a, a map maker? Oh, uh, that's a great because you're an artist. Awesome. Let's bring you on down. Let's sign up and get you there. Then like, you get on the bus and you drive all the way to Detroit and they get you there and they go, oh yeah, that one's full. That's uh, that's full. You can't, but you know what you can do? You can run out and catch bullets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a, 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 a dude that competed on the national team, this guy Bobby Clayton, who was out of the U.S. Army team. He was the one who was uh, getting me to think about doing it. He always freaked me out because he was really religious. And when I was 18, I was such a, a godless loser that I, really religious people scared me. Like I was, the one thing I was scared of competing against was religious people. Like when I was, I wasn't scared, black people at first, until I beat my first black guy. And then it was, uh, it was religious people. Cause I would see them sitting down, like reading the Bible before they'd fight. I'm like, motherfucker. This dude's got God on his side. Like he's got God on his side. I don't even fucking know what's in the Bible. All I, I went to Catholic school for one year. All I could think of was this fucking guy's going to have Jesus on his side. He's going to kick my ass. But this Bobby Clayton guy, every time he would uh, fight, he would, he would sit down and read the Bible before he would go out there. And he was on the U.S. Army team. 
came real close to following that dude's footsteps. He was a couple uh, steps ahead of me in the, the tournament scene, mm -hmm. and I was, I was looked up to him, so I was like, wow, maybe that's the move, maybe the army. And I look back on it now, and that, that the f weird feeling of indecision that I had when I got out of high school was, makes me so sympathetic, you know, and uh, that's why whenever anybody tries to criticize the actual people that are over there, the actual troops, I'm like, man, that is you know, well, they're the, they're the one who's actually pulling the trigger. Then the one, like, man, you don't even know what kind of momentum is behind being a part of a machine like that and mm -hmm. being a 20-year-old man or an 18-year-old man, right. and, you know, and wanting the respect and admiration of your peers and your fucking, your, your CO is telling you, whatever the guy is, the head guy is telling you that they'll give you an extra leave if you kill a guy with a knife. You know, have you ever seen those guys the, describing this? There was a, yeah. There's a video... I don't want anybody to look at it right now, but there's a video called um, uh, American Soldier Throws Away His, his Medals. It's uh, one of those um, uh, Iraq veterans uh, against the war videos where this guy talks extremely candidly about his time in Iraq and killing civilians. And, I mean, it's intense shit because, you know, this guy's not proud of this and he's swallowing his words and he's talking incredibly honestly. But... His fucking his chief officer, whoever the fuck it was, the head guy, told them they'd give him four days leave. They'd kill a guy with a knife. So they had an extra incentive to kill a guy with a knife. And you're like, mm -hmm. wow. wow, America, fuck yeah, <laughs> yeah, fuck yeah, freedom. Yeah. Whew. Yeah, it's a, it's a, and it's a. I think you know everybody in some way. I think I think you're right about trying to figure out a way that have some some more perspective on you know. Just putting the situation putting people in the situation where they have to kind of go through that for themselves and kind of discover your inner warrior and you know, like that that's just that kind of becoming uh, a person um, uh, male or female just trying to figure out what that next uh, step for you is, is separating from the nest and and becoming your own person um, and you know to uh, we can we can talk around it all you want but at the end of the day there are monsters in the world uh, most of them are us, and you know that's that's what comes. You know, we are we have the capacity for amazing, wonderful things. We have the capacity for some horrendous, awful things as well. And I think part of that having that warrior awakened in you is is um, more about understanding the monster in you and understanding how to keep that at bay and understand how to keep that in check, so that you know, making it a global a global perspective and I am in no way am I a hippie or you know um, delusional about like we're all just gonna have world peace someday it's not it's just not the case you know you have to we're gonna be struggling with our inner monster forever and some you know there are monsters that are just out more in areas and the reality is we have to keep that in check well we lack any sort of a logical use guide for being a human mm -hmm. you know we we essentially go on the experiences of people before us and occasionally we get wisdom like that poem that you read or that uh, excerpt uh, excerpt that you read which is genius and brilliant from a man who lived 200 years ago yeah but you know more than likely you get a fucking moron for a dad who pumps bullshit into your head until right. you're 18 and then you leave and you're like these fucking niggers are trying to take our jobs and like <laughs> You know, he's a poor <laughs> fucking kid. He's in, you know, you were like, here's a shovel. Here's a job for you. Oh, yeah. you're quitting. Yeah. There you go. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weird thing. I've where... tried to hire your nephews. They keep leaving. <laughs> morons are allowed to raise morons, and you're allowed to homeschool them too. You're allowed to sit them down and 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 teach them the same idiotic nonsense that you learned, and 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 keep the same pattern of fear and and ignorance going. It's uh, it's very strange. It's very, and there's no way to cure that either. I mean, who is any man to tell any other man? And until we have some really incredibly sophisticated ways of measuring competence, that are just rock solid and uh, you know like a, like a litmus lick a you know I used to do a joke in my act about if you know you could find out if you're an idiot as easy as you could find out if you're pregnant. You just go and lick something and look at it and go, I'm a fucking idiot. There's no way this is broken. You throw it away. There'd be a pile of idiot detectors up to the fucking moon, and you'd be right. like, bullshit, and fucking throw it down and grab another one. Until that happens, how do you say a man can't have a baby? How do you make, say a guy, you know, uh, can't raise a family and teach it its own his own values? You can't. Well, I think there's, you know, not that I want to get all 1984, but the, it, I think in terms of like, say, for example, health benefits, 
if the if you go in to get some kind of you know something for your cold or your you know you're just basically sick now you know your 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 arm got chopped off okay that's I, we understand that but like as far as just general health if uh if for some reason you go in for that kind of general health stuff and they just i think they should be able to run your credit card statement to see if you've been to McDonald's lately if you've been to McDonald's <laughs> yeah. you if you if you've yeah. been drinking coca colas or eating the candies or hitting you know hitting the hitting the fast food it's like mm, yeah. no you don't get anything yeah. i've had this idea for a long time is that the the way to strengthen america is really to make less losers so anytime there's any sort of a situation like that there should be some resources dedicated to pulling people out of that in a, in, a, in a really enthusiastic way, the same way there's resources dedicated to rebuilding Iraq after we blow it up. I mean, there should be a way to like let people know the infrastructure of America needs to be rebuilt too, the mm -hmm. infrastructure of humanity, the yeah. infrastructure in the age of information with all the, all the stuff that we know about what it, what, what's important about being a human being, we should invest some resources into that and mm -hmm. developing human beings in that way. And if you're going to provide them with free health care, you should also provide them with some sort of an education and, and some sort of a, some a, a actually acceptable form where they're going to really absorb it of, the fuck you're doing to your body stupid and taxpayers shouldn't be paying for this and you know we might have to put you in a state where everybody eats Big Macs we might have to force <laughs> you into some place you know you're gonna, you're gonna have to move to South Dakota because that's the Big Mac state you want to keep eating Big Macs all right well you can still be on the government nipple I was writing a story at one point that, that was kind of like that where it was uh, some detective and he starts realizing that there's some people that keep disappearing and it, you know it's kind of a missing person's case and it kind of turns into like a lot of missing people and he starts kind of looking over, you know, he kind of put the board up, they got their faces up there and realize, all these people are really large. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it turns into this whole sci-fi thing where it's like actually the, the aliens have like kind of infiltrated the government. They've like engineered this, you know, this, the corn uh, products, all the, all the syrup. And they're basically like the government's like, yeah, for, you know, for whatever technology, we'll, we'll take this and we'll feed our people this. And the aliens are harvesting the fat people to put in their <laughs> rocket ships to... S <laughs> they power around. their rocket ships yeah, like whale like, oil. We're fossil fuel. Like wow. they're just kind of harvesting. Why not? The right? large people. We had this. Uh, I, I said this, Rob Wolf yesterday, the author, author of the Paleo Solution. Brilliant, brilliant guy. But what he was talking about government subsidies and corn, and the reason why there's so much corn out there and corn syrup, and it's used in so many different things, and it's so terrible for you. And it's like, and it's not even economically feasible. He's like, the government is actually paying these people to grow this shit because there's not a lot of profit in growing it. Like. Somehow mm -hmm. or another, some hustle has put in, been put into place, and yep. the direct result of it is a billion fat fucks. And it's harvest. Yeah, it's amazing. They, they're fuel. coming. They're gonna suck us <laughs> up. They're gonna put us in a fucking engine. Yeah, yeah the twist would be on the, on the, you know, like all of a sudden there's a, a, a very large family, and, and they're not being harvested. Like, what's going on? It's like, well, it's just they're genetically. That's that's their that's their genetics. They had they they haven't been fed the corn syrup, so they're they're just being passed over. So it has nothing to do with actual, like, large people. It has to do with people that are specifically, like, g gorging on the corn syrup. Well, if we really do encounter alien life and that alien life actually eats biological matter, we're going to be <laughs> fucked. <laughs> yeah. Just the same way pigs are fucked. Mm -hmm. The same yeah, – pigs are fucking smart, man. There's a, I stopped eating pork for a couple of months once uh, – a couple of years, actually. Sounds like I, a nightmare. It's a pretty rough time. <laughs> Uh, I saw my brother's keeper. I can't talk to you anymore. I, no, I can't talk to you anymore. <laughs> Have you ever seen the documentary, My Brother's Keeper? It's about these, uh, sl they, they were slow. They had some sort of a mental retardation and they ran a farm. And um, one of them was accused of uh, murder or something heinous. And it, they, it probably most likely had been pinned on them because they were slow. Well, these guys running the farm, they, they went to kill a pig. And when they pulled out the shotgun, the pig saw the shotgun and went, fuck! And the pig is fucking running left and right, trying to get away from this guy, recognizing the gun, and freaks out. And then finally he gets it and shoots it. And I remember thinking, man, pigs are fucking so – I can't mm. be eating pigs. Because you could shoot a cow in front of another cow, and the, the other cows barely react. And he, like, looks down. I don't, I don't have showing. a problem with that, but I'm like, shooting that pig is kind of fucked. But Aliens are going to treat us just like all pigs. All due respect to my, my, you know, my, my pig brother, Bacon Dude. Can't, oh, can't yeah. let go of the bacon. Apparently, the slow cooking method Rob Wolf was explaining is the shit. You're supposed to put a grill, electric grill, on 200 mm. and cook it for two hours, yeah. and the bacon becomes insane. Yes. 
Absolutely. I'm not ready to commit to that. The crispy stuff. sounds great. I, I feel like an asshole. It sounds like, like he said, it would be like like an in, like an incense almost. Your yeah, whole house would smell like bacon for two hours while it cooks. Yeah, I mean, that's a good way to become a fat fuck. Twitching. But if there are aliens and they are a million years more advanced than us, they're gonna eat the shit out of our. Yeah, fat we're like asses. faux gras for them. Yeah. We've been stuffing ourselves with all this fast food and corn yeah. and stuff. We're grain-fed <laughs> cattle. Cattle aren't supposed to eat grain. Neither, neither are people. You know, those are, that's what they, how they finish them on that shit. That's how they get them all nice and fat and juicy. Finish him. Finish him. Are you still working on uh, a perfect circle at all? Are we ever going to see uh, another uh, album? Because I know for a while you were working on something, and then it kind of dissolved into, I don't, I don't even know what happened. But, um, um, but yeah, you never know. There's always, there's always possibilities. My uh, ex-girlfriend had a perfect circle tattoo, and I always had to look at it every Did time. Did you have was... a jizz on it? <laughs> yeah, because nice. it was right on her butt, so every time I... <laughs> I'm not very comfortable with this kind of stuff. <laughs> so let's go back to when the power went out, man. We were talking about Hicks. Yeah. Um, you guys uh, put Hicks on a... You thanked him on a CD because you got a hold of one of his uh, cassettes, and you enjoyed mm -hmm. it. And but you never you guys never actually toured together. But you no, came we, close we, to we, it. We planned it. on it. It was basically a plan we were kind of setting into motion in like mid ninety three. Uh, and you know, talking and that's when the song when he came down and that was kind of part of why he was coming down. We're trying to figure out what we were gonna do. Comedians yeah. and rock musicians like that, it's a it's a weird combination. Bobcat Goldthwait did a, a lot of uh, work with Nirvana. Mm -hmm. He opened up for them. We had him in here, and he told some hilarious stories about them just fucking hucking shit at him, mm -hmm. screaming at him, and fucking murder in their eyes. Yeah. Get off the fucking stage. Yeah. Meanwhile, he's yeah. friends with them. They want him to go out there. It's like Yeah, like I, I actually approached uh, David Cross a couple of years ago. Hey, man, we're going to do another show. He's, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I would say no, too. Uh, no. I wouldn't want to. Yeah, you don't want to eat dick in front of a rock crowd. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's not like the being right. Being with coins and stuff. It was all. It's a weird combination. It's like you're not providing them what they're there to see. You're, you, you've got to turn. I mean, it might work. I've seen guys do it and pull it off, and it, it, it can works work. With, it works with Pussifer. Yeah? Because yeah, it's just, it's just that, the nature of that project. Because it's that silly. It's, it's it's just that there's just all this different stuff going on. You got film and you've got you know, you've got video and you've got you know, animation and you've got we you know for one tour we had uh, Neil Hamburger opened up for us. Really? So, oh, that's awesome. You know, so that's just and then in the middle of our set he would come out and interrupt and go, I forgot a joke, and then he'd just, you know, <laughs> he just do you know just bum the audience out for a minute and then wander off and uh, I can take funny. take my drink and my chair and sit down in like in my spot and take up space for once. You know. What was the song that you guys did where you filmed the video inside of a trailer? Inside of a, a uh, condition, Conditions of My Parole. That's yeah. a great fucking song, man. That's great. Is that's that, that you really your Airstream? Song. Is that your person? <laughs> I'm so jealous that I want to buy one so bad. We're I talking about really getting awesome. one as a, a portable uh, podcast studio. Yeah. You know what we should do? Do yeah. that and then come to people's towns and do, oh, you yeah. know, because we could broadcast out of a 4G, just, st you know, a 4G connection for Verizon is pretty goddamn sporty. If we just find a place yeah. that can support it. Each show we would have to have a, uh, we would have to have one for each show. Like we'd have to have yeah. a contract for each show because then we would go over our data so we would have to get like 50 of them yeah that's true we would have to get a sponsor well this ting ting wants a sponsor some ting? new yeah video some new um rather cell phone company maybe they could do that oh that's cool so um you what you um when you got into hicks for me i was uh i was a young comedian living in boston and i was uh working at the comedy connection I had been doing it probably about a year. So like it's probably like 1989. Where'd you live in Boston? I live in Newton. Yeah, I live in, I live in Davis Square. Oh, did you really? Oh, yeah. cool. I used to work at Boston Pet Center down on Leachmere. Oh, really? It's not there anymore. Nice. It's some awful something there. Boston's a great place to grow up, but a terrible place to die. <laughs> Just, and I felt like I was dying there. Yeah, it's, it's, look, the people are cool, they're smart, it's interesting, it's cool, it's a real town, but it's too fucking cold. It's just too fucking cold. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's like, I kind of, I feel like there's a parallel between San Francisco and, and Boston in a way as far as that bitter cold. I'll take thing. San Fran every day, son. Yeah. I'll take San Fran all day. I yeah. like San Fran maybe a hundred times better than Boston. Yeah, but I, and I, I guess I, yeah. I'll, I'll take that. I just, <laughs> I just, I think the San Fran should just change like their license place to say, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you think they're doing it wrong? They just, no. What they, 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 they think oh, you're they doing, think it, you're wrong. doing yeah. it wrong. No matter what you're doing, yeah. you're doing it wrong. They're, they, they go over the deep end, but they go over my preferable end. They go, <laughs> they go over the lefty deep end, which seems weird coming from like a cage fighting commentator type dude, but 
I don't, you know, I, I, I like people that are kind. And I think that even if the people on the left are doing it the wrong way, and even if they're crazy and self-righteous and pretentious, mm. I think the, the idea behind it is they're trying to be as kind to as many groups of people, you know, and, and offer uh, the, the, a, a commensurate environment for as many groups of people as possible. So I, I support that, even though I think a lot of what they – think in this nonsense and it doesn't go along with human nature and behavior and, and right. you know i want to alpha them sometimes and grab their neck and shake them like a fucking child and yeah. get it together bitch yeah do some squats <laughs> have a fucking steak you're you're on planet Just earth rub bacon on yeah. your nose get up bitch get up have a fucking shot of whiskey and let's do this um i, I just uh boston is just uh uh, Boston is a liberal in the same way too, but just angry. Oh fight. yeah, there's there's definitely some there's some Irish anger going yeah. on there, and ugly I women, that. cold. Yeah, I got really in trouble once. I toured there and like it was like one of my first times back in Boston. It's like back back in Boston, dry cunt capital of the world. Like, it was like <laughs> crickets, like no, like as many fans as we have in the United States, we're like mm, yeah, we're done, we're done now. <laughs> <laughs> dry cunt capital of the world. Oh, it's hard to find a good one in Boston. And when you find a good one, you cling to him like a cork in the ocean. Please keep me afloat. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Um, I saw Hicks at the Comedy Connection. And uh, I saw him because he was on the Rodney Dangerfield special. And, I, you know, I was a aspiring comedian. So I went to see everybody who was on the Rodney Dangerfield special when they came through town, you know. Mm -hmm. And Boston was one of those pit stops. It was like Chicago, Boston. You know, there was places where people would come through and, you know, you, you would guarantee that they would be in your town eventually. And uh, <laughs> Hicks went up. He went up at the Comedy Connection. Or the first time I actually saw him was at Nick's Comedy Stop. And he went up after this guy was an incredible hack. The guy was like, cop, donut jokes, cartoon, smoking pot. And like the mo all the most hackneyed, obvious premises. And he was mm. killing. Audience was filled with idiots. Nobody knew who Hicks was. Me and maybe 50 other comedians in the back of the room. Out of 300 people who were in the audience, places packed, by 20 minutes into the show, half the people have left. You know, I mean, literally cleared out at least 50%. By the end of it, it was maybe 100 people left. <laughs> and it was uh, 50 audience members and 50 comedians. And, we, and he didn't give a fuck. He never – I would – if one joke would go wrong for me, I would go into a tailspin. I would panic. I would go uh, – I would r rush my jokes. I would say fuck too much. I would just I – would, I would not have any confidence. He's in the middle of this bit about how Satan – fucks John Davidson, who, mm -hmm. if you don't remember, John Davidson was the host of That's Incredible. <laughs> it was, was the, you know, one of them, it was like the internet before there was the internet. So he, it's a demon with his thorny cock is fucking John Davidson in the ass. And John Davidson swells up in the off season because he's pregnant with Lucifer's baby and he shits out Oprah Winfrey or <laughs> or Geraldo Rivera depending on where Hicks was at mm -hmm. and so Hicks is standing on stage shitting so he's pausing going <laughs> I mean it's fucking minutes man minutes of just just straining and people just getting up and leaving and he looks up in the middle and goes yeah this usually clears the room <laughs> <laughs> and we're just crying, <laughs> laughing, and I got to see him bomb horribly, but yet still kill for fifty to a hundred people. And then I got, I got to see him, you know, kill right. for the whole the whole crowd. But what a an, an interesting guy. It's like he was doing something that nobody else was doing. I mean, he was like he was injecting Noam Chomsky and and you know and, and philosophy and Terrence McKenna, and it was like. Like, whoa. Like, what? Yeah, I didn't even know. Like, when I first saw Kinnison, Kinnison was the first time I ever thought I could do comedy. I was like, you know, I, I thought, saw these guys rolling up their sleeves, talking about, did you ever notice? And it's like, well, I kind of could do that. I guess I kind of could do that if I had to do that. But then I saw Kinnison uh, and, and, you know, fucking screaming, I was married for two fucking years. And he was angry and it was funny and I was laughing. I was like, Maybe that. Maybe there's a comedy for me. Maybe I can find my comedy. Right. And then when I saw Hicks, I was like, oh, this guy just flipped the whole fucking thing on its head. Like, yeah. now it's 
Now it's, you know, it's about formulating a philosophy on life and that there is a possibility outside of the direction that we're going in and it, it is possible for the human beings and the, the, you know, the, the human civilization to rise up and, and, and be about love and be about understanding and be about intellectual curiosity and, and to be free of judgment. I was like... This guy's a fucking comedian? Like, this is the craziest <laughs> shit I've ever seen. Yeah. Like, it's almost like his jokes were an afterthought to inject his philosophy into the audience. I think partly, yeah. Def absolutely. Yeah, so what a... But I've loved, I, you know, I kind of like, uh, you know, spend a little, I spent a little time in that little comedy world for a while. It was very, always very inspiring to me to watch uh, comedians like him uh, basically just stick to their guns and finish their act without getting that nervous sweat. I mean, it was always inspiring to, to see that, and... It's always my favorite comedy clubs to go to are the ones that, you know, you end up, if you're sitting out front of uh, the man's Chinese, they give you tickets to go to this free comedy club. Go then. Because if it's a good comedian on, you can, like, take bets to see how quickly the room's going to clear. Especially, <laughs> the, you know. And we had, I think, I remember one time he had, uh, Andy Kindler did a whole thing where he brought everybody he knew down there to kind of have, like, a little... Uh, side, you know, side seats with all the comedians that he had in, uh, up his sleeve, and they did a whole like uh, debunking com comedy, like a like a hack a hack uh, class, <laughs> and they had everybody come up and just do like the hack thing in front of this audience, and this uh, all these people that just kind of won tickets from you know got tickets to the Man Chinese, and they're just I don't understand, like that's funny. <laughs> why, why is that hack? That's funny. Like, and then you know that whole thing went on for like an hour, you know, hour and a half. I was just, I'm in the back of the room, just peeing myself, watching them go through this. And then some dude gets up after them as their act and does everything that they just went through. And the audience is like, "Boo, that's wow. so funny! Can I have another drink?" <laughs> like, and then David Cross gets up. And then just clears the room. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Opening line just, you know, I saw Schindler's List the other day, and Schindler's List finally saw it. Uh, it's not that funny. <laughs> this whole table of people just get up and out the door. Like, and it just, every joke that he said, it was like we're watching, like, he just set off a bomb there. He just set off a bomb there. <laughs> cleared the room. David awesome. Cross is uh, rarely credited, but in my opinion, of watching it all happen, he's the uh, originator of the idea of alternative comedy. Because mm -hmm. I saw him do an alternative comedy in 1988. Mm -hmm. He was in, in Boston, right? Yeah, Catch yeah. in Cambridge. He would go up and he would do. I remember one time he was doing this this uh, exercise video where it would teach you <laughs> teach you how to stretch. <laughs> So he would play the exercise video and he stretches like, I really do feel a stretch. And he was like doing this like long, and people were like nervously giggling and not, showing where, not sure where it was going. And it never went anywhere. It never went anywhere. <laughs> but it was amusing. You know, I felt, I felt he was like a better version of what um, Andy Kaufman was doing. Because Andy Kaufman would get up in front of like colleges and like read The Great Gatsby. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's kind of fucked. It's, <laughs> it's not really funny at all. Like, this is kind of crazy. Like, it people, is now. Yeah, it is now. Yeah, it's like a delayed reaction. As long as you joke. don't have to like witness it, it's great. Long term absorption. Yeah, but Cross was, he was funny while he was doing it. It was, it was weird. It was just so silly. It was actually funny while he was doing it. Do you like comedy? I, I, I like music because I'm completely unmusical. I don't have any skill. I don't have any talent. I don't have. I don't understand it. I don't. I see those bars that might as well be Tibetan, you know, Sanskrit. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So when I, I see someone perform music, when I, when I I'm, I'm in awe. It's like to me, it's a, a beautiful, wonderful experience. Do you feel the same way about comedy because you don't do comedy? Do you, you watch comedy and you just get a like a free sense of enjoyment that you might not get from watching something that you actually I generally Dude. enjoy more uh, scripted, like a film comedy. When I see a, a group of guys who have figured out, not a formula, but there's just a, there's a rhythm to their comedy and they've actually created a character behind, you know, that actor brings something to the table that you want to look at and then their timing in this scenario where it's clearly they're just play acting. It's like, hey, we're just playing dress up pretend. And you still laugh because the writing's solid, but the, what they bring to the table with the writing is solid. So like, you know, when you're seeing things like, uh, the movie Super Troopers. It's just like those guys had to have a lot of fun making that film because everything was just like the writing was perfect. It's it's a quotable film. It's like every step of the way. It's every every scene is quotable, and they're just having fun. And then you see, you know, almost almost any Will Ferrell film. Step it's like brothers. those guys just yeah. 
uh, John C. Riley is like just a master at yeah. just bringing his thing to the table yeah. and like making your script come alive. Uh, it's just a great, that it's to me is like, and I, and I look at that and I go, how the <laughs> fuck did you do that? I have no idea how they did that. And I have no idea how to be funny. And just so I'm watching them just like nail these things out of the park. Like you could put all that script on the paper and show it to me. And I would just go, which I don't know where do I start? Like, you know, how is this funny? One of my favorite all time <laughs> comedians is Mitch Hedberg. And one of the reasons why Mitch is one of my favorites is because none of his stuff was funny on paper. It didn't make any sense. Like you would see, like, he goes, you know, somebody asked me, do I want a frozen banana? I said, no, but I want a regular banana later. So, yes. <laughs> now, if you saw that on paper, you'd be like, like why is that funny? <laughs> what the fuck is that? I might have butchered his joke. I don't no, think that's pretty close. I think it was pretty close. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I love that. I love that he redefined comedy in a certain way, too, because he, he made some. First of all, the guy was a heroin addict, and he had only clean comedy. I mean, his stuff was squeaky clean. You know, meanwhile, he was gangrene in his leg because he was fucking shooting in the same vein too many times. Uh. It was really a strange guy. And his material was all so odd. And mm -hmm. if you loved Mitch Hedberg, it was awesome. But, like, Mitch Hedberg would go on after these guys that would, like, sing and dance and do song parodies. And, you know, they would close with a rap. And he would eat dick. He would eat dick so bad <laughs> that the club owner would try to switch him with the middle act and say, listen, the middle act's been doing stronger. We're going to have him close. We're going to give him your money. And then, they, you know, his manager would call, and it would be, like, a big problem. And it wasn't necessarily that, you know, he was uh, not, uh, not a, a funny comic. It was, like, it was the, the completely the wrong setup for his type right. of comedy, whereas right. it's a delicate environment where you could take a guy like Kinnison, and it didn't matter who went on before him. When he stormed that it's stage, loud. oh, 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 yeah. you're like, well, this fucking room has changed. The environment has changed. Hedberg would get up there with sunglasses on, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it just goes, barrel. Never play tennis against a wall. They're relentless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And you just you would just start giggling, and it would it would be a slow build. And he was one of the rare guys that would have uh, non sequiturs. Everything was be a non sequitur. Every single bit. I'm sorry. I, what is that drawing on the wall? That's a vagina. That's uh, yeah. what a child would draw, a, like in high school, maybe. Who that's, drew that? That's Brennan Walsh's uh, drawing of what he thinks Barbie looks like. And it's right next to Pam Anderson. Right next to Pam Anderson. <laughs> They're, they're we had we had an artist on fake. one of our other That's, podcasts. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it just was no. like, it kept screaming at me. From this whole place head. is a giant distraction. Look, there's a, there's a flashlight right here. Our former sponsor. There's <laughs> fucking cats all over the table. There's Super Mario Brothers behind We're, you, playing. Yeah, there's a, a mannequin tit, stormtrooper helmet. Ron Paul's in here somewhere. Where's Ron Paul? Ron Paul's over there somewhere. Yeah, She's that. leaving. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a. This is a weird little setup we have here. What is with that fucking painting, man? That's what I've been wanting to ask you. Is uh, that yours? Yeah. Burn that thing. No. That thing. Okay. If you look far away, if you if you look at it far away, it looks like a naked girl. Yeah. Look at it close up. It looks like shit. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. <Jack. laughs> Thanks, Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> Appreciate it. Listen, I only said that for humor. <laughs> I don't really mean that. So no, I, I have I have questions for you. Please. Um, and it's uh, regarding Anderson Silva. I want to know what you think is coming next. So is he going to, are you on the inside of that? Is it, uh, what's happening I next? can give you a scoop. Most likely, it'll be one of two things, depending on what they can talk him into. And Anderson is uh, in a very rare position where he sort of gets to choose his opponents mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, it'll be there, you know, based on, like, he didn't want to fight Chael Sonnen because he talked so much shit. He didn't want to do it. But he also did because he wanted to silence him. So mm -hmm. they just had to financially motivate him. It will most likely be either this kid, Chris Weidman, who's uh, the best up-and-coming 185-pounder or one of the best. He hasn't fought a lot of guys, but he's uh, I think been I've heard about outstanding. him. He's a pretty, pretty solid dude. Just destroyed Mark Munoz, who's uh, also a top-10 contender. And the way he did it was just so f just complete and total – the way he anticipated all of his moves, countered them, almost strangled them three or four times in the first round. He's a pretty young kid, him. right? Yeah, and a spectacular wrestler. So it's him. 
he might get it, but he's he's a bit of a tough sell because uh, there's a lot of folks in the mainstream that don't know who he is. He's sort of more of uh, someone who he he can beat Anderson Silva. I mean, look, who the fuck knows what's going to actually happen, but mm -hmm. it may be possible that he could pull it off. He has the right set of skills, but he's not known as well. Um, but the other option is if George St. Pierre beats Carlos Condit, okay, then then they have some fucking crazy super is, fight. Is that the guy that they mentioned at the end of the fight? Uh, and, and the end of which fight? Pierre, uh, when they were saying, so are you going to fight him? And he went, nah, I want to fight him. Oh, no, that's John Jones. Okay, Jones, right. Yeah, he said he doesn't want to fight John Jones. But John Jones really is in a, a, a totally different weight class. Not just, Anderson has dabbled in the 205-pound weight class. Okay. But really, he makes 185 pretty easily. He doesn't have a problem making 185. Uh, and John Jones could never make 185. Okay. John Jones is six foot three, 240 pounds, 230 at least when he's walking around, and then he cuts down to 205 slowly, you know, over his camp. You know, cut probably cut loses the last, you know, probably 10 pounds in water weight. He's just a way bigger guy. He's way bigger, and he's a really strong wrestler. And stylistically, he's a nightmare. And apparently, they have a, a mutual admiration for each other. That's it can it can be bypassed, you mm -hmm. know, with the right amount of money, and right. both guys would probably agree to it if the right amount of money was on the table. But right now, you know, they've both uh, stated their admiration for each other, and they're probably number one and number two pound for pound fighters in the world right now. Mm -hmm. People would like to see that, but honestly, I think George St. Pierre and Anderson are more physically the same size; it's closer. Okay. George has a struggle to make 170, whereas Anderson is uh, a, 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 he makes 185 pretty easy. George can make 185 and be the, basically the same size, and okay. that would be an amazing fight. Yep. That, I think, if, if George can get through Carlos Condit, and I, think, I believe they're going to fight in the fall, depending on George's recovering from uh, ACL surgery. Okay. So, Ouch. Yeah. Yeah, I've had two. And if George gets through that and everything's cool, that, uh, and if he beats Carlos Condit, which is an F, you know, Carlos is really good. He's very tough. But if he beats him, then they go uh, to probably – uh, Dallas Stadium. I'll probably do it in that big, giant, fucking okay. sixty thousand square foot. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be yeah, incredible. I'm just looking forward to the next. You know, I'm looking to see what, what happens next because uh, I was that was a pretty amazing. Yeah, fight. Anderson's a uh, he's a ninja. I mean, he really is. He's a real master martial artist in a way that, like, what what he does. There's maybe a, a tiny handful of human beings on the planet who can move the way he moves. Right, and so I think uh, going back to some of that, you know, that relaxed state we were talking about before, I just it's really watching him, watching him operate. It's it is like Jordan at his at his top yeah. top of his game. It's just this this panther, this this art, this ballet uh, yeah. of movement, uh, just just uh, fluid. Yeah, and uh, connected. Um, and I think a lot. I think a lot of that's just. It seems like a lot of that's missing from the UFC these days, or any, you know, any mixed martial arts uh, forum. It seems like there's that. You know, there's the awesome gladiator. Go, you know, watch two dudes bang it out. But there's that art that I just kind of miss from the earlier days of watching it be the, the, the bracket system where you had to kind of, you know, s suck it up and get through three dudes in one night. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, the old wrestling days. Well, what Anderson is is so much better than everyone else that you get to see that art. Whereas, yeah. like, you see a couple of dudes that are really close to each other go at it. You don't – they don't have that, 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 that giant skill level above their opponent, whereas Anderson does. Like, when it comes to striking, Anderson's the most accurate fighter we've ever had inside the octagon. Like, no one has been as accurate with him, and he's – He's so, he's so fluid in the way he moves. He does things, and his opponents don't even realize he's done them until they land. And you're like, what? He, he's like the master of like sneaking shit in. Mm -hmm. It's a really unusual dude. And the reason why he's able to do that is, you know, mixed martial arts as a whole has really only been around since 1993, and we're seeing this constant evolution of mm -hmm. it. But Anderson represents... At right now, what's possible? The furthest, right. the furthest evolution of the game, as far as it's ever gone. But the reality is, in his individual disciplines, he's not as good as the best guys. There are right. better kickboxers than him. Right. There are better jujitsu guys than him. And it's like one day we're going to see a guy who can do to Anderson Silva what Anderson Silva can do to Chael Sonnen. Right. I mean, we haven't seen it yet, but we're going to see a guy who has Hicks and Gracie jujitsu and 
Badr-Hari type striking. Right. You know, and when that happens, I mean, man, and that's it's inevitable. It's the the sport is moving in that direction. It's like this constantly accelerating process. And right now, it's the only people that are successful are the completely fanatical and obsessed. You can't get by on sheer athleticism. Right. Like, you see some basketball players that they probably don't work out as hard as uh, they could, and you know they maybe don't, but but they're good enough to get by, and right. they have enough gifts to get by in the pro. Basketball when, players, yeah. tall and arrogant. When you get to the <laughs> when you get to the top, the upper echelons of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, there's no room for anybody but the fanatical. Mm. There's no room for anybody but the obsessed and the right. the Rory McDonalds of the world. These like young guys that are coming up that are just insanely good, and every time you see them, they're much better than they were six months ago. Right. That's the future. And that's uh, that's, one ins that's inspiring yeah. just because it's it's a it's definitely that that chess game that we spoke of earlier. Yeah. I feel like it's it's more interesting to watch because although I don't have necessarily the frame of reference for what's actually happening, when you actually go back and look at the tape and go click by click, you go, oh my god, yeah, that guy, exactly what you're talking about, John in your corner, just going this and yeah. this and then this, yeah, it's. It's, uh, it's chess moves, and it's, it's millimeters. And with a guy like Anderson, there's no one to tell him to do that because he's that guy. Right. You know, Anderson really doesn't have it. I mean, he has guys that coach him in Muay Thai and coach him in Jiu-Jitsu. When it comes to MMA, Anderson, nobody, nobody's going to tell Anderson what to do. Right. He knows exactly what to do. He's at the top of the mountain. Right. It's beautiful to watch someone who's at the very best of the, 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 like the, the peak, the apex of whatever that is right mm -hmm. now. You know, whether it's fucking motorcycle racing or whatever it is, gymnastics. When you see a guy who's at the... There's a, a quote from the movie Vision Quest. Did you ever see that movie? Yeah, with Matthew so. Modine. Remember that movie? Mm -hmm. Good yes. fucking movie, man. Why are you laughing right now? That's a Why great am film. I laughing? That's a great Because film. I forgot all about it. I haven't watched it lately, though. I don't know if it held up. We should watch it now. We should. Let's What's see. that girl's name in there? The girl with the black hair was hot as fuck. Um, Remember she moved into his house and he was he caught, caught smelling her panties? Remember that? Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, there's um, a scene in the movie where the guy is... Uh, Do we have the, to Google that now? The kid yeah. is the top, <laughs> you know, uh, he's like one, one of the, the top wrestlers, and he's about to face a state champion wrestling, this huge thing, and he's blown away by it, and he's working as a uh, uh, delivery man at a hotel. He's working as a, um, a room service guy. And one of the cooks in the hotel and him have this conversation about... The guy seeing uh, Pele, or I think it was Pele, but it was seeing some incredible soccer game and seeing this guy do something that just for that one moment you you rejoiced in that guy's movements and his ability to do something astounding, and for one moment it like it raised the entire group of people that were watching it. Right. For one moment we were above the apes, we were mm -hmm. above right. the the shit chucking monkeys, you know. Mm -hmm. Linda yeah. Florentino. Oh, she was so hot. She was ridiculous. Whatever happened to her? Uh, got um, a sex change. She's now yeah. Sylvester Stallone. She, yeah, she's now Sylvester <laughs> Stallone. She actually doesn't look that bad now. You got a Google photo of her yeah, currently? Uh, I mean, for being... I'll take it. You know, Sylvester Stallone. I'll take Stallone. it for nostalgia. Candlelight. Oh, yeah. Um, one candle, quarter of the room. Don't see that much. Everybody's good. Hmm. I apologize, Linda. Yeah. <laughs> you don't remember Sylvester Stallone. She was in Dogma? Weird. Weird that you even know who's in Dogma. Did you see Dogma? Yeah. I haven't seen Dogma. I win. <laughs> okay, who have no, you seen? Was Dogma uh, good? I don't even know. Uh, what's the the old? Uh, oh man, I'm gonna blow this. Sorry. So, uh, so that's still John old. Travolta. <laughs> Uh, Greece. Oh yeah. Uh, have you seen Greece? Yes. Yeah, I watch I it all the time. Yeah. I have not. You I haven't never watched, seen, never Greece? seen Greece? Did you reject it? In the I think it was one of those day? things that just kind of went by, and then all my friends were like, "Ah, oh, we, you know, fuck Greece." And I'm like, you know what? I've decided, I'm never going to see that movie. <laughs> Whoa, that's so that's how I am. Conscious decision. The, about door, the, the Doors movie in Greece. Oh, oh the Doors movie. The season one. finale of Lost was mine. I said, you, you haven't seen that one? He, he watched the yourself. whole thing, and then up to like the season finale, he decided not to. Yeah. So he doesn't know. Wise. Wise. Did you, you, Mike, did you, you got me it? enough. You, you made, hit you me with it. enough nonsense, you yeah, fucks. You, yeah, you, you were a wise man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what did you just bring up as an example? What was the other the one? Doors the Doors movie. Why not The Doors movie? I don't know. Just one of those things. I just all of a sudden just didn't watch it. That's right before Val Kimmer went to New Mexico and grew his head. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was what got him. His head. <laughs> he became Jim Morrison for a little bit in his right. head. Apparently, like, on the set, he was, like, so method that he was, like, you know, being Jim Morrison. 
right. fucking did a great job of Jim Morrison. Right, better I mean, than John Malkovich. Did John Malkovich play Jim Morrison? Right, in the words of uh, Marlon Brando, why don't you just try acting? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a. I love that he said that. The whole idea of people talking in character. Like, I read once that Angelina Jolie and John Voight used to get on the phone and they would have full conversations, father and daughter, in character. And I was like, that's a crazy bitch. Okay, and she's broken. He's broken. He fucked up raising her. She's a mess now. Like, I, was pass. To, I was talking to a friend of mine, like, uh, we were somehow Jennifer Aniston came up, and, and we kind of segued from Brad Pitt you know, off into Angelina Jolie, and we both were like, we kind of paused for a moment, and went, "Fuck, dude, how crazy is that? How, how, like, Brad's just got to be kind of sitting there, like, just kind of going, it's just for the press, because this bitch is nuts." Like, <laughs> you say that, but I bet she fucked the shit out of him. I bet she sent him for. Uh, a, in, a, in a sexual ride that Jennifer Aniston is completely incapable of. I bet she's way too self like self conscious, too controlled, too you know, too reserved. Angelina Jolie had Billy Bob tattooed on her fucking arm. She fucked Billy Bob Thornton, tattooed his name on her arm, and then carried his blood in a vial around her neck. That bitch is loped out. Angelina Jolie's got some big old remember titties. Remember that? Pull that up, man. <laughs> Pull that video up. You remember? That was yeah, a just, fucking great. That was yeah, a great I song. That's, that's just, and I think for some reason, uh, maybe I. Lindsay Lohan. I don't care. I don't care what kind of bell rope she tugs. I just, I think the crazy just completely outweighs any of that. Just You're the, right. The drama that's attached to any of that yeah. stuff, I think, is just like not a part of my world. Like my friend know. Tony always said it best, though. He said psychotic. And erotic are next door neighbors, man. Mm. <laughs> right. They really, they're so close to each other. I could see that. And the craziest girls I've, I've ever seen dated. That. <laughs> yeah. The craziest girls I've ever dated was about, the best of that. This is uh, Lindsay Lohan. Got some big ass titty. It don't matter if you see cups or D cups, whatever. I'm trying to get in your ass without spinning my cheddar. This bitch is no better. I'm hotter than a nigga that's wearing faux sweaters. Nine times out of ten, I'll leave that panties more wetter. So do the math, put it together. If you got big ass titties, I'm down for whatever. Shit, man. I'm spinning my cheddar. Cause this bitch got some titties like, damn. My. This is a different song. No, this is just, just you're just re, you just remember the chorus. Which Angelina is, Jolie got, got some big ass titties. Okay. It goes into it. I need to see them C cups, D cups, yeah. I need to see them A cups, B cups, yeah. I need to see them C cups, D cups, yeah. I need to see them A cups, D cups, She got some big ass titties. Why it kill me? She got some big This is a different version, man, I'm telling you. She got some big ass titties. Angelina Charlie got some big ass titties. This is a different version because the other one was more sing song. Angelina Zhao Lee got, got some, some big, big ass, ass titties. titties. It was like more rhythmic. I think these guys bit them. Could big be. problem this in the rap community. Yeah, big problem in the comedy community, which just brings me back to Bill Hicks. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I was a big, huge fan of Dennis Leary for mm -hmm. about six months mm -hmm. until I saw Hicks. Right. And then I went, what the fuck? Oh. This guy's doing the same jokes. Right. But, and, and, uh, and no disrespect to Bill, but I think... As you've probably seen mostly in that comedy world, uh, the, the beauty of Hicks was that that was his world. He was staying in that world. This, mm -hmm. is, this is his whole purpose is to do this thing. Right. Most people during, you know, during that period of time were, they, were, they, were, had their, <laughs> it's kind of like, they almost had their eye on the Johnny Carson position. Oh, like, yeah. Okay, do this, and then you do this, and you get this show, and then you do this thing, and you get to be Johnny Carson someday. Kind of like a, the subject of uh, you know, uh, Shakes the Clown. You're like watching everybody try to be, you know, you know, Binky, yeah. you know, Binky's trying to get that position and the you know, shakes and all that and mimes, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but I feel like Larry was, you know, whatever you want to lay on him as far as like, you know, biting that style, it doesn't matter because as, as it went on, what he ended up doing with all of that, he ended up becoming, he making his own thing. So even though he kind of maybe, you know, it clearly, <laughs> just clearly. Like, Carbon copied that, uh, yeah. but you know, in his defense, I feel like you know, back then, uh, it was war. You know, you're trying to make your make your way, and I think. Eh, I don't he, give that. He, I don't give him that. He, it wasn't he really. A, he could have. He, he could have come up with his own shit. Yeah, but I think you know, I had the same problem with him for many years. But like, just you let it go. I let it go because he's fucking yeah. funny. 
Yeah. You know, some of those, uh, watching uh, Rescue Me, there's some, there's some tasty bits in that. And his, uh, the movie he did, uh, oh, man, um, where he was a burglar and he's stuck in uh, this house. Uh, John Lovitz in him, is that what it was? No, no. no. Oh, man. He could eat shit in Spider-Man, though. Did you know he was, in, he was in Spider-Man? Did he suck in Spider-Man? Is that I what you're saying? He's just stupid. Why is he in that movie? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Someone needs a dad. It's like you couldn't yeah. just get anybody else to play. I'm not a fan. Uh, I, when I find out you're full of shit, I'm I, I, no, sorry. I, I can appreciate that he does well at some things, but until he comes clean about being full of shit in the first place, he can go fuck himself. And it's, uh, not interested. I'll call him out. Yeah, not interested. I'm going to get him and Bill Murray in the same room, and I'm going <laughs> to do some correcting. There's two guys where I know where the, three guys where I know where they were when they died. Rich Jenny, because it was just so crazy. The, the committed suicide and uh, Kennison because he was my first influence and then Hicks I was at this club in Connecticut Hartford Connecticut and me and this other comic were in the green room and this girl came in and goes Bill Hicks just died and we're like whoa yeah he died he bit, yeah, it was like overnight yeah and I was in uh, I was in a hotel in Detroit we were flying to Europe the next morning and uh, I woke up in the middle of the night like just bolt upright. Uh, you know, whatever time that was, I can't remember what the time it was, but like I basically was awake. And then we got up the next morning, and my pager, mm. beeper, uh, got a message from Duncan, his manager, and it was like Bill passed last night. And the time that was quoted that he passed was when I woke up in bed. Whoa! And it was pretty creepy. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Your stuff. He actually went via wherever he was through Detroit to tap me on his way. I was like, dude, I'm sorry to make you go to Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a really quick trip when you're in hyperspace. <laughs> it's probably right next door. Yeah. It's probably reaching over and pressing. And I found out about his. Uh, I found out about his problem because I had an awful nightmare. And when we were, I was at a one of those kind of motels where you got the, the you can pull your car right up to the outside and it's kind of like the two stories and you kind of walk through the the breezeway between the thingies and there was like a hundred people there and everybody was just bawling their eyes out and Bill wasn't there and I was like what the fuck is this dream about so I called uh, I called uh, um, his manager the next day and I'm like I had this fucked up dream about Bill and he goes yeah I can't really talk about it and nobody because nobody knew yet that he had pancreatic cancer I had this fucked up dream and I called his manager and went what the? I had this weird dream about Bill. What's up? And uh, he's like, yeah, I can't really talk about it. Weird. Do you believe, like, I mean, uh, there's no way that was coincidental. No, no way. No, no way. What is that? What's going on there? Yeah. Is there a zero, a zero, zero dimension that is like a next door neighbor that you can tap into? That I, don't, I have no idea. Dynetics. You know. <laughs> Diuretics. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Yeah, I don't know, but it was it was pretty. You know, and I had a couple moments like that with him over that time. That's why I'm saying, like, when he died, like, I was just, you know, yeah, of course I woke up in the middle of the night. Never, so. I've never had anything like that happen to me, but I absolutely believe it's possible. Yeah, it was a weird. It was a weird time. They say the most provable form of any sort of psychic phenomenon is the ability to know when someone's looking at you. They said that statistically, you can prove, you know, you can have people stand and have their back facing a group of people and they can statistically tell with you know a certain amount of uncertainty and guesswork but you can show on a graph that people can tell when people are looking at them mm. if that if that if that is possible if that's valid then these, yeah. then these other things are definitely on some level valid because it's, en it's energy have you ever um, heard of the work of Rupert Sheldrake? He's this guy who believes in uh, the morphogenetic field, and he's, he's done like research showing that dogs can tell when their owners are coming home. Mm. He believes there's some sort of a frequency that we're all tuning into, that all of our consciousness is connected to some, mm. some type of grid, and you can recognize when that's in motion. And you can recognize d things and events, things that are happening, and it, it's just a matter of us being sensitive enough to tune it in. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's... Um, I think that's really one of the weirdest things about being a human being. Is he doing like, I don't know. Is he right? No, no, he's not doing that. I don't think he is. <laughs> he might be. I doubt it. If he does, he'll be okay. He's just a mess. He's from Ohio. You know it is. Eh, I rescued yeah. him from Columbus. Eh. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to believe that we're slowly but surely moving from the phase of, you know, grunts to language to written language to internet to psychic 
ability to communication. Mm-hmm. I mean, I want to think that it's, but uh, there's so much room for fuckery. There's so much room for fake sidekicks. But oh yeah. So when I hear a story like yours, I was like, aha, I can bank on yeah, that. I mean, one. you know, that you know, I, I have no reason. I have no reason to lie about that. Yeah. It's not like it's gonna make or break my career, you know. Yeah. So. Well, it does it's, sound cool. It sounds pretty cool. It's pretty bitching to bring up at a party, especially if you're in front of a fire. Touch me. <laughs> But everybody wants to fucking claim psychic. Everybody wants to claim it. It's so hard to trust people. Oh, no, I don't think that no. shit. That's, and I think the, the problem with all of that is that we're not, uh, probably on some, you know, uh, universal level, we're not really allowed to completely be able to tap in and rely on it. Although I do firmly believe that, you know, each one of us has to kind of really listen in to the, uh, the intuitive mm. side of ourselves to kind of just yes. follow your heart and know what path you're supposed to choose because we all kind of have a role to play I think. yes and, and you kind of have to like find that happy medium between like making yourself happy and making sure you're fulfilled but also kind of doing doing your part you know make the, everything work the intuitive is such an interesting um point because your intuition depends on your respect for your consciousness it, respend, it depends on your respect for your honesty about your own actions and your own thoughts and your own ideas. And I find that when I am uh, the most at peace with my own actions, then I am a much, a much better in tune with other people. And I've, I've met people that were completely full of shit. I'm like, how does this guy not know that he's full of shit? Not know that no one's going to buy this? I'll tell you how, because he's lying to himself. Right. He's, li- he's lying and, and negative, you know, in a way, positive reinforcement for his negative actions. If he yeah. keeps winning, yes, even if he's not, negative, yeah, that's just going to reinforce that action and reinforce that behavior. When I'm most honest with myself is when I get the most intuitive reads off of people. I had one friend, my friend Brian Callen, and I, I, he used to, he was like the worst guy for like being involved with friends that would turn out to be crazy and idiots and thieves and nuts and worst, the worst uh, connections with girls. And, and I would always, be, I was like a big brother to him. You can be all right? Always, you okay? He's you worried about you doing coke. Me? Yeah. <laughs> Are you doing coke? What's in your hand? Bud. Oh, Bud. Bud Light? No. Show, show sold out tonight. Oh, it is? Yeah. Powerful. Yeah, if you uh, wanted to come down tonight, who knows? Maybe someone won't show up, but uh, it's Mad Flavor, a.k.a. Joey Diaz, Brian Redband, the man to my left, uh, Josh McDermott, our good friend from that show, 30 and fucked in the ass or whatever it is, and me. And uh, 1030 did, here, Ice House, did Pasadena. You, did you right. ever experience, uh, experiment with any drugs? Did you ever do like mushrooms or anything growing up? Do you know or? this is on the internet? Oh. <laughs> People can hear this? Yeah. Dude, be careful what you say. I'm just joking. Jesus Christ. I'm just joking. <laughs> you, you look at me like I was... I'm like, oh, wait, was I not supposed to talk about something? <laughs> you, you looked at me like, what the... Well, I mean, you, I you mean... You looked at me, I just lit your chair on fire. Younger, when I was, like, in 93, I, I saw, went to Lollapalooza, and I was really a, a hippie kind of back then, and, and uh, Tool was one of the... Uh, because I, I used to be a Nine Inch Nail fan growing up, then I became some hippie, and I, I remember seeing Tool and going like, "Why am I not?" Li- that was so listening? 1992. <laughs> I'm moving on to 93. <laughs> Fuck them. But uh, a lot of I, I always wondered that because I, I mean, especially your uh, old video, uh, sober. Uh, you know, just the visuals on that was just you know amazing when you're on mushrooms. But uh, did you ever play with any of that kind of psychedelic stuff? Never. 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 Yes. Um, <laughs> dude, what, what was the song that you did to the Fibonacci sequence? Now you're on drugs. He's, he's, a ch- he's, uh, he's, he's beautiful. He's beautiful <laughs> in what he is. You can't fake a Brian. I mean, he is just, that, that's who he is. Yeah, there's no... What was uh, the song that you did uh, to the Fibonacci sequence? Um, uh, I believe it was uh, Foggy Mountain Breakdown. Really? No. No. <laughs> It was one of those songs. One of those songs? Yeah. Whatever it is, you can find it online, Google it. But um, that, the, the, the Fibonacci sequence, I watched a documentary about it once where they, they showed pine cones and mm. you know, pineapples and sunflowers and all these different and show that there's some sort, and it, some sort of a mathematical code to nature. Right. And I, and I think the funny thing is like people like myself actually trying to like force those numbers on a song it's kind of it's kind of funny it's kind of clunky because the song is that any song is that so you know to kind of like force, is that it, Brian? force these no, it's song. like it's like you know my kid 
playing with blocks. Like, oh, look, they're square and they yeah. stack. Um, yeah, every everything is that. So to like actually like right, your face for, is that. Force that into a song is a is a little uh, soft work. So I'm I'm reprimanding myself for being a little silly. Oh, you're <laughs> not. You you were, I thought it was an homage to the uh, the the order of the universe. I didn't think it was silly at all. But that's as a fan. Mm -hmm. uh, I I enjoyed it. But I, I which is short for fanatic, and I have to go now. <laughs> that's why you know you look at someone with a nose job and you go, what the fuck is going on here? Something's you've wrong. You've ruined the sequence. Yeah, you've ruined the Fibonacci sequence. Mm -hmm. You know you you got to make. You gotta make lemons out of lemonade. You gotta you gotta make soup out of the ham hocks and the beans that you've been given. <laughs> and it's just it just is what it is. And when 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 you, when you really find out that there it truly is a mathematical sequence that the whole universe is based on. It it it's one of those things that really makes you step back and go, we are, man. We might as well be fucking cavemen because even though we like to think that with our 4G connections and our satellite dishes and our cars that we somehow or another have elevated from the biological, like, boy, we're so we're still so base. We're still so stuck in the 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 rut of the mud. Mm -hmm. You know, we we don't we we really have barely wrapped our heads around how complicated and insane and diverse this whole thing really is. Mm -hmm. And the Fibonacci sequence to me is like one of those real, real mind fucks that makes you just pause. And there was a, a particle physicist recently, uh, or a theoretical physicist that was talking about when they, they study quantum mechanics, they find that there's some sort of an embedded code to it all, that it's not just an embedded code, it's mm -hmm. a recognizable code that is used in mathematicians and they said look this fucking the whole universe is a program mm. like it's a program you know whether you call it it's whether it's a biological program or whether there's intelligent design and it's been done by some engineer like from prometheus movie whatever mm. it is there's a program to this right and uh, you know i kind of i was always uh playing around with a story where you actually the only way to time travel would be to somehow connect into the base of your dna and there's actually a time code in the dna and you have to like reset it so that all of a sudden you just end up in this other, you know, time zone. But then you would your software would be compatible. So this whole script fell apart just before my eyes. Well, yeah. Imagine if you did decide you were going to go into another dimension and you go into the the other dimension and you would just be engulfed in complete madness because you don't have the tools to deal with that new right. Fuck. <laughs> That's like oh, that. Like you go to you go to you go to hit, you hit enter and you're like, oh, I forgot a zero, and you're like, oh. Oh. just that fucking constant <laughs> kaleidoscope till the end of time. Yeah, it's like that movie or the the Twilight Zone episode when uh, was it Burgess Meredith mm -hmm. it was all just all he wanted to do was read and just leave me alone. Leave, and he's in inside of a, a library and a nuclear explosion happens and everyone's dead, but he's surrounded by all these books and then he breaks his glasses. He's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Just forever in this downward spiral of inability to perceive his environment. I'm worried about him. Nah, he's all right. He's, you know. I was worried about him for the first five years I knew him. Then I, we, we, got into a, we got into a groove. I think I he might have a problem with alcohol. No, no. <laughs> he knows exactly what he's doing. It's the only okay. way to kill the hangover. He does start, <laughs> when he starts slurring, you're going to get nervous, but it's, he's okay. Is he looking at me again? Yeah, he's, he's always looking at you, man. He's got monitors, too, so even when he's not looking at you, he's looking, looking at you. I'm looking at you through monitors. And That's what you like, really need to think about is the fact that after this is out. over. He's playing a sold-out show tonight at the thing. Yeah, the Ice House. The Ice House. Yeah, he'll be up there. He'll, he's a comedian. He's got some funny jokes. He's, he's looking at me again. Yeah, yeah. You should come tonight. I'm working. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, you should let people invite themselves. That's, uh, that way you don't get rejected. <laughs> no, I'm actually pouring wine tonight at uh, oh, Everson right. Royce. Oh, you, if people yeah. want to go see, where is it at? It's uh, Everson Royce. It's uh, in old, old Pasadena down the street here. I've heard crazy stories about you at these uh, at, at signings. Uh, I've heard at shows, there's shows, shows that you've done where you tone your entire back to the audience mm -hmm. during the entire performance. Have you done that? Uh, I, I have really a, an awful sensitivity to uh, flash, uh, flash cameras and uh -huh. flashing. So if I if the if you just can't if people can't control themselves, I just have to I, I can't I can't focus on what I'm doing, because I'll actually like go into a convulsion. So 
I have really? to, I have to like turn my back. Like an epileptic convulsion? I can't finish the set, so I'm sorry. I have to turn my fucking back to you. <laughs> I didn't know that was even real until my friend Jim's wife is epileptic, and uh, my message board would have these uh, avatars that would flash. And, you know, and, and, and that's basically nobody's business. So it's like, you know, yeah. what are you doing? You mean? You know, I, I asked you to fucking put the camera away, dude. Maybe if you told them, hey, I'll being go nice. into a fucking seizure. Meanwhile, they get right up in your face. Try yeah, because yeah, then you got the asshole who's, uh, who's still into Nine Inch Nails from 92, and he's going to do the flash thing because no. he hates me. I, and he hates you. you for leaving them. Hey. It's you, buddy. It's abandonment issues. He pointed at you when he said that. Do you, do you, do you know Trent? Do you, do you work with him a lot, ever? Uh, I'm, I, we've met you know, several times, uh, probably more than, a se more than several, but uh, I haven't talked to him for years. He grew his neck. When Val Kilmer grew his head, he grew his neck. I haven't, I haven't seen him for a while. Is it? Is he it? Got, he got swole. He's, he's huge. Yeah, yeah he, he looked like he started bodybuilding. I think, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, that was. I think he did start lifting, uh, but I don't. You know. It's a weird thing for a musician, right? Isn't it? Like at one point in time, musicians were always sort of. One of my favorite fucking scenes. I almost forgot this. Is you, uh, some guy jumped on stage and you hip tossed him. And then took his back and continued to like He was like, he's ready for it. I, I, I'm just, you got it? Yeah, it's right, right oh, there. Oh, you got it right there. What, what was that about? What was going on there? I mean, um, you, you obviously, you didn't hurt him, so you sensed that he was friendly. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was my stage. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's if you're up so, there, you get choked. It's so beautiful. You give him, like, the... The, the the arm around him when he thought you were, you were like going to yeah. do a uh, like he a, just took his back. <laughs> it's so beautiful. But well, the beautiful uh, thing is the guy didn't even try to fight that hard. Look, he throws his arms up in the air. He's well, like, Woo! he was just thinking dick against his his his, his butt. His butt. Probably, yeah, he's like, ah, oh, this is the best. I'm gonna have a baby. <laughs> I'm gonna have a tool baby. I mean, I'm gonna have a baby. Really, it's gonna be painted blue. It's a pretty <laughs> rare situation where you got the the perfect. <laughs> Retarded fan. I'm gonna have a baby doesn't fight hard. Blue. And how cool was it for him though? You were singing while you had his back. Well, the th I think that's a that's a you know there's not there's no footage online that actually shows everything that we actually had a guest singer come out on that song right at, right during that. So like, not only did the kid like have to deal with you know me doing that, but he had to sit through this other singer doing a thing too. <laughs> so you just held him. I kept yeah, the back control. I, I had the I wrapped the cord around his neck <laughs> and continued singing. So because I, I would, cause I'd slack, so every time he would go and tug the thing, <laughs> that's so beautiful. Did he fucking look at me? Was he talking to you while this is going on? Is he saying I, anything? You don't know, no mutters. I, I gave him a back rub too because I felt bad. <laughs> <laughs> Did, you know. Come on, see a little pat on the back. Come on. And where the fuck is security while this is going on? They what? knew to leave you alone. Back then, you had it. Now see, there's the guy coming out to sing. It's uh, it's Haytham. Uh, he's a friend of ours. He's what year was this going on? I don't know. Ninety-seven. Sixty-four. Sixty-four. Let's see. Back back when you didn't get sued for shit. Right. Yeah, because that happened now, you'd be Oof. you'd be fucked. Yeah, you can't do anything. Would you not you do, do that shit. now? If that guy know. came out, you'd probably do I it will again. knock you out. I would. <laughs> You would yeah. just do it anyway. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I don't know what you're doing. I yeah, no you could be crazy. Uh, you never know. That guy uh, that killed Dimebag. You know, Dimebag Daryl. Yeah, I did it yeah. once when I was I got younger. Two words for you, John Lennon. Yeah, <laughs> I did it once when I was younger at a Ween concert, and now I look back at it, I cringe just thinking the fact that I fucking got up on stage. And they actually had to stop. Their, like, they were in between songs. Did you really? Yeah, and then I jumped back into the audience. But I was like, it just makes me sick to my I mean, I was like 18 you right. know, at a Ween concert. But uh, I, I can't even imagine doing that now. If it makes you feel any better, if I was right next to you, I'd be like, do it, pussy. <laughs> do it. I know, that's Get up there. <laughs> do Go, it. man. We're both Ruin 18. the show. Go. Ruin the show. Do it. Fuck. They'll be fine, man. This happens all the time. Well, just I, get up there. It's like some bands like like it. Like I remember Mighty what? Mighty Boston. Force the nip slip. Force yeah, the yeah, nip force slip. The nip slip. Mighty Mighty Boston's used to like almost welcome people on the stage if yeah. I remember correctly. So yeah. I think that's why yeah. I did. I was like, oh, right. all bands are like this. Yeah, you know, it's a social event. Yeah, I'm yeah, not trying to do anything crazy. up here. I'm not trying to like convey a thing. Right. Jump on up. What's up with uh, your music not being on iTunes? Is is that something licensing bullshit? Like, crap owns. Mm. 
I'm sorry for asking questions like this. <laughs> You're so mad. Closer for imperfect circle around iTunes. Oh, they are. Uh, yeah. What the fuck are you talking about, son? Well, I I, I recently went through a thing where I uh, sold all my CDs, a lot of my CDs, and I bad bought, move. Rebuying them on digital. Bad but, move. Yeah. I know. Keep them. I know. Higher quality. I know. Is CD much higher quality? Uh, well, now that they've got, there's a new version of, you know, like MP, uh, MP4A or whatever they are that, are that are pretty solid. It's a pretty solid, and it all depends That's on That's iTunes format, it all, right? it all depends on how you do the compression, because there's ways to do it where the new digital formats are actually pretty badass. And but, just as good as CD quality? Um, it's pretty, quite, you would never notice the difference, Well, I think. especially when you're listening to it on this fucking thing. Like, yeah. Right. <laughs> like that uh, Portlandia episode, like, doesn't it sound great on these little speakers? You know? you, you're Fuck. one of those artists that emerged through the, the digital takeover mm -hmm. of, of music. What was that like for you to watch that happen where all of a sudden your shit was online and, you know, to go through the, the you know, the whole, the, the, the whole scene with, uh, well, you I mean, know, some people just kind of, you know, tried to fight it and there's other people that did, you know, they had to do whatever they had to do to, to kind of embrace it. Uh, I know, there's one thing I know for sure. You cannot download my wine. <laughs> That's right. Not a digital format. Not yet. Not until not we have those yet. printers that not can print yet. out your wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a joke. Yeah, What's know. crazy is that it sounds is. retarded. Just it's five years ago, that sounds retarded. Walking around with a phone that's not connected to anything. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, Jay Leno has one of these 3D printers in his shop. He put some video online of him making parts for old cars with it. Yeah. It's fucking amazing. I mean, you just yeah. run it through a scanner. Next thing you know, it's, it's a, there. It is. Right. Yeah. And that's the beginning. Yeah. I'm, I'm loving this wine though. I, I it's actually, delicious. I actually. He has a problem. He has a problem. Yeah, he has a problem. He's all right. His problem is it's okay. It's like at all the problems in the world, you know. When was the last time you were at the Olive Garden? <laughs> the last Motherfucker. time. Motherfucker. Yeah. You motherfucker, you did it. I would have to go there for me to be my first time. Oh, you have never been. I'm not snooty. <laughs> Is it hard to find good I restaurants in Arizona? Snooty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. where we are, there's a, there's, a, there's a handful of pretty awesome places, but there's not as many as we would like. Uh, How far are you away from Phoenix? Two hours. Two hours. Well, Tucson? Uh, we're th four hours from Tucson. Uh, yeah. and, and then the other, other area of note is uh, Sedona, right? That's yeah, where Sedona has a, like, even Sedona has only a couple places that are really good. But you'll take that uh, just for the small... I just cook myself. Yeah. You know, I just do my own raviolis, and we, you know, we have our own gardens and orchards. Yeah, that is a cool thing. We have a cook. I just started doing that this year, growing my own vegetables. We'll have like a salad made out of our own mm -hmm. vegetables. There's something cool about that. There's something hunter-gatherer that just... Yeah, and it's anybody, and even in a big city like this, if you have a, one of those apartments that has like a little bit of dirt near you, you can make your own food. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Any any square, five square feet of dirt near you uh, in, your, in this community, you can grow enough stuff that you can get with your neighbors and trade that's my ultimate goal you do the garlic and i'll do the potatoes and yeah. you do the tomatoes and then you just trade and you're happy when i see uh, a guy like you like do something crazy like start a vineyard you know that that to me is far more complicated than what i ever wanted to accomplish but what i ever want to accomplish is find a way to live sustainably off one piece of li land you mm -hmm. know just, whether it's a farm uh, you know, a small family farm or what, you know, livestock. Just yeah. As to, romantic as it yeah. sounds, it's not necessarily that feasible. I mean, there is, there's a lot of draw, there's a lot of things that just, you know, yeah. nature will, nature will school you. It's, it ends up really coming down to uh, collaboration. It really does come down to, to not just hunter or gatherer, uh, cultivator, but like also community. You have to kind of work together to mm. make any of that work, and that's that's the reality of it. There's a lot of people that have that romantic notion of like, I'm just going to go out to the woods and just and just live uh, off the land, and you're going to live a very short life. That's where a cult comes in. That's where the cult comes in. You so buy the land. Yeah. So there's start definitely like it's, it's definitely possible to do those kind of things, but as far as quality of life and longevity, long, longevity of life, uh, the collaboration ends up actually uh, fitting better. That community, that village ends up really, really working. It's hard to find that, though, isn't it? It's hard to find some like-minded people that you can enjoy and But it's, and al it's, it's already with. happening. There's, yeah. like, there's, entire, there's entire, even in where we live in Arizona, there's entire uh, communities that have, uh, you know, the, the garden, garden communities. And, mm. uh, you know, we're making pastas now uh, that are from 100% Arizona wheat. 
so we can grow wheat, we make the flour, I can actually um, you know, make pastas for you that go with the wine, which we also grow, but the things we can't, I don't have, so we don't make salt. You know, there's like spices you would like to have and that kind of thing, so you, it ends up being, you're back to the trading, you know, trading your wares with other communities, and that's great. Uh, but then just all the nutrition that you just get, you know, the basic uh, fulfillment of that homegrown stuff, it, it resonates on a, you know, microfiber level in your body for sure yeah it's pretty badass and arizona is a tricky place too because you guys don't get a lot of rain we get a little bit of rain and uh it's a matter of making sure you're planting in the right spot where the rain gets to the uh, cisterns the cisterns yeah so you have to water storage carry the wa rain water mm -hmm. and figure out a way to move it mm -hmm. yeah it's um have you ever thought about living somewhere where it rains a lot is that like a, a, a better option mm, no I, I, uh, I just, Arizona's just where I'm supposed to be. Just, you know, I grew up in Michigan, so that's pretty moist, and yeah. uh, it's got those mosquitoes and deer fly, and, and deer. the humidity, and I just can't, my body doesn't resonate in that place, and uh, I just get attacked by every bug and every creature known to man in, in places like Michigan and Seattle and Washington State and all that, but in, in Arizona, free and clear like yeah. there's there are scorpions i see them now and then i've seen the rattlesnakes if none of that stuff bugs me none of, that, none of it goes after me my dad who lives in michigan you know he's in michigan like none of that stuff bugs him the deer fly the you know the mosquitoes and stuff it just kind of like bounces off him it's fine comes to arizona immediately gets bit by a brown recluse <laughs> A wallop by a tiger, chased by a fucking rattlesnake, wow. and you know, like all this stuff. <laughs> like, Arizona Jesus. just went, "What are you doing here? Get out!" He got bit by a brown recluse. That's no joke. Yeah, like a big hole in his leg. Oh, oh my god! Yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, what it that's does? disgusting. The, another thing they found uh, with uh, Arizona is um, uh, jaguars coming across from uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. There's a, there was a show called Monster Quest. Where the they car were... jaguar? No, they... no, no, the animal. I... Yeah. It's leopard in Africa, right? Jaguar in South America? I think so. They've started to see jaguars in, uh, in, in, in Arizona. Hunting yeah. Republicans? Or... No. No, yeah, just after Arpaio. They're just after that Joe Arpaio <laughs> guy. That's got to be a weird thing representing your state. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you uh, tell people you're from Arizona, and they go, oh, yeah, that's that fucking guy that makes people wear pink. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful state to live in because it's the last state of the union. We're the 48th state, so we're kind of the infants and we're kind of the mavericks in a way. So there's all this unresolved, like archaic shit that goes on there, but there's all this amazing, beautiful stuff as well that we actually get to do because we're not kind of a part of the East Coast. Like this is how it's done. We've been here for 200 years. Like mm -hmm. uh, it's actually we're kind of you know still finding our way in a way, and so there's. There's the good and the bad that goes with that, and there's, you know, probably a lot more bad that outweighs it. But I don't, I'm not exposed to it because I'm, I mean, in a good, th is, you know, on that note, uh, you know, the wine industry in general is, was met with like, you know, that's for that's, you know, it's alcohol, it's, it's wine, it's you know, re the religious right and the re and the conservative Republicans initially were like, what are you doing? But now we've changed so we completely changed the agricultural and economic landscape of that state with what we're doing with the vineyards to the point where the governor, God bless her, uh, has actually gone on record with uh, the municipalities and said, support what he's doing. Get behind him. That's how, that's, so to have a conservative person who's like probably teetotal or anti-alcohol, all that kind of stuff, or have somebody like that who you already know her story, like to have them support what you're doing is like, you're we're definitely making a mark. In That's Arizona. a That's beautiful cool. thing. If your governor wasn't a fucking moron, that chick's scary dumb. She's so. Have you ever seen some of the debates with her? Holy shit! Where they asked her questions and she just locked up and just stopped talking. And you're like, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to stop talking. And then she still won. Whatever yeah. that means. Yeah. I but can't. she supports you. Yeah, the, uh, it's it's an amazing th it's an amazing thing to witness the, the kind of the naysayers coming around to like you know, having to like explain to them over and over again. There's like these small communities in Europe that they weather whatever storm you throw at them. They don't care who's king or dictator or right. president. Uh, they're small <laughs> communities. That, they're small communities that grow their own food. And the, mm -hmm. and the cornerstone of their, of their economic stability is, is our vineyards. And, you know, something that like takes dedication and time and focus and commitment to 
a long-term thing, and then everything around it can then sustain itself based on that being the hub. Do you ever recognize how unique this is for someone who has uh, achieved your position as a musician and, and you know has, someone, has had so much cultural influence? To have this sort of radical change and just go off and start a vineyard and and, and become a, a small local business and you know, aid the community like that. I mean, it's a really kind of a unusual departure. Well, I mean, it's only a departure if you're only looking at the part of my life that had to do with music. If you're looking at the part of my life that came before the music, you know, I was part, I was part of the military. I was I was accepted to West Point to become an officer, and I chose not to go to so to go into the arts. Um, so I was in some way already doing these kind of things in a way. You know, you got your military and you got your politicians. Um, I was kind of part of that part of that structure to begin with. Um, organized sports, military, ballet. You <laughs> shut up. Man. So you've you've pocket pool. You've Pocket's managed to, to really be your own unique individual. You've re really managed to not find uh, a pattern to fall into, but rather fall into the pattern that you felt personally drawn to. Yeah, you know, kind of like, again, going back to just following your intuition about what your decision, I mean, when you're standing there and you're having to make a decision, like when you receive that appointment in your hand going, okay, I'm going to be an officer. I'm going to go to West Point. And when I get out, I see, I can see my future all the way to the, to the end. You know, classmates of mine are now like, you know, colonels, in charge of several divisions in Afghanistan, so that would be that would be what I would be doing right now. I mean, you know, I can't say that for sure because I, I'm not nearly the the de dedicated soldier that those guys are and uh, that kind of vision. But as far as that part of that corporation, that part of that company, uh, that's what I was. That's what I was. That's my path was laid out in front of me. So to see that and go, I can be a part of that whole thing, or I can follow this feeling in my stomach right now and go, I think I'm going to go to art school. <laughs> so to actually make that decision and have all your friends and your family kind of go, what the fuck did you just do? Yeah. And that was long before you'd ever heard about me. And to know that that's what I was supposed to do uh, and to follow that against anybody else's um, advice, um, you know, that's, that's a, strong, a strong statement when it comes to following one's intuition. Do you realize how inspirational that is? I mean, to, to a guy like me or to, especially to guys coming up that may, you know, or, or they, they have a vision, they have an idea, and they see someone like you that they admire that has done that and really has uh, so obviously carved out the, the life that they really wanted to live based on their intuition, based on their idea, which so few people ever actually do. You recognize that influence? I mean, because that's a, that's a huge thing for folks. Um, yeah, it always, it's always going to come down to what you, what you are going to decide for you. Uh, it's kind of hard to... Um, I had a, my old... Uh, back in uh, uh, Michigan, I went to a church. I did go to a church. That's, I might disappoint you, but uh, actually I actually had a... I went a, to a few. A minister, uh, a pastor, I should say. Uh, and the only reason I went to this place is because this guy made sense super low-key awesome speaker he told stories he had no judgment I mean you know there's one point I was having problems and you know people are thought that I was way too into kiss and Alice Cooper and they wanted <laughs> me to talk to the preacher and he called me in the office you know, I kind of went into his place and he went he shut the door and he goes so tell me all about this man I was like I can, you know, he's freely and he has a smoke and he, he just listened to all of that stuff and he started kissing you? No. <laughs> really? Can you, too, can you say that with your pants off? No, he didn't. No, nothing, nothing like that. Like, uh, and it was nothing. Like, he right. just like, was just into like, so what is it about this right. that like, resonates with you? What is it, what is it that like, inspires you about it? And I was like telling him these stories. He goes, I'm a storyteller. I like that you like to tell stories. You should tell more stories. And I started writing poetry. I started writing stuff based on that conversation with him. So, you know, out of that, and they used to tell a story that I thought was very pertinent. Uh, you know, you'd go off to camp, and you'd have some experience there, and you'd come back. And uh, whatever you experienced out there, whatever, whatever camp that was you went to metaphorically, and you come back to the general populace, it's, he, he would always tell the story about Moses coming down from the mountain and having his mountaintop experience and then coming back down to the rat race to where people he's a changed person. There's something different in his eyes and he's watching everything that's happening and there's no possible way he will ever be able to like explain to his 
the people that he sees daily, what the fuck happened? Because it didn't, didn't happen to them. It happened to him. He saw it, and he just has to kind of, you know, live his life on that and not be disappointed in his, in his friends and family and his community because they didn't see it. So it's not, it's not their fault. They didn't, they didn't experience that. But he has to, like, not, he has to kind of understand that, A, everybody has to go through that themselves if they're going to go through it. Like, you know, the thing we talked about with kids going into the military and having that, like, that moment where you're on your own, you know, you stick your hand in the, in the jar with the ants and, the, you know, that, that kind of thing you're talking about, that coming, becoming uh, an adult. Uh, he used to, he would tell that story and it was very important, a very important lesson for me to go, okay, you're on your own with these decisions. You kind of have to have these things and not everybody's going to get it. So don't worry about everybody getting it. Just as so long as you get it. hard for folks, though, to have that sort of confidence to branch out independently on their own with their, that vision, that it's idea. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. But that's the only way you really yeah, you find your to. own path. Yeah. That's so hard for people to accept and so hard. It's not what people want to hear. They're, 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 you know, it seems it's so terrifying to be completely independent of all the people around you giving you other advice, but it's the only way to do it. And if you see, you know, that's, that's, how, that's how things happen. You see something that's not being done or you see something that you want to have happen, if it's not happening, go do it. It's gotta, you gotta be honest with yourself as well, too. You have to actually know what you really truly want. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will talk themselves into things that they want because there's maybe security in it or, you know, they could see a, a connect the dots future. Mm -hmm. but, dude. Thank you very much for coming on this podcast. It's Problem. been amazing. It's a, you. you got an awesome story, man. You're, you're a bad motherfucker, and you've done a lot of cool shit, and it was really fun having you on. Thank we, you. we enjoyed it. Thank you for having and, me. Uh, yeah. I'm really sorry about Brian. <laughs> What's wrong with you? I'm, kind of, I'm sorry I was nervous around him. It's okay. It's natural. I, I will wear pant, pants next time if you ever come <laughs> back. That was, that was kind of awkward, but I got, I got over it. Uh, thanks for the wine. The wine is fantastic. Yeah, if people want awesome. to get a hold of it, it's, uh, just, you have two. Um, Caduceus and uh, the other one Merkin, was Merkin Vineyards. Merkin Vineyards, mm -hmm. and uh, they can get them at most fine wine shops. Yeah, we're gonna, Available online? Uh, yeah, uh, we have a website, uh, vino.caduceus.org. Uh, we're going to start taking pre orders. But, but their problem living in Arizona is we can't ship during the summer at all. It just gets too hot, and everything that we ship goes through Phoenix and sits on a hot truck at 110 degrees overnight. So oh. we can't ship there. We have to wait till October to ship stuff. Oh wow. wow! But uh, we have some. So pretty, how does that work? We have some pretty awesome stuff coming out on, uh, on, uh, you know, going to be available this uh, first week of August for release in October. Awesome. So uh, that's when people. Is there stuff available now, or is it you? Yeah, if you, you go have to such like, limited amounts that if you go to places like Silver Lake Wine or Mission Wines or Cano Wine Merchants, a lot of those guys have stuff that we've distributed. You know, and, and across around the country, you know, we're only in a very uh, just a handful of states. Uh, we just our production is so low. Again. Uh, people want what they want, but when it comes to the wine, there's only so much that's going to come off this site, and we have very limited amounts, and it's a very special thing. So uh, we're not going to, we can't, you know, even if I wanted to increase the production on some of these things, we're just never going to have enough uh, to just you know, basically be in every grocery store around the country. It's, it's pretty it's obvious, so that. You take great pride and satisfaction in your work. I mean, when you're talking about your wine, you have a certain, like, your feeling about you, like, this is something you, you're really happy with. Mm hmm yeah, it's a it's a it's it's a very fulfilling endeavor. It's a it's a it's an art form that's uh, like no other, uh, and it's kind of connected. Grapes are a very special being. They are special. Beautiful awesome website, dude. I really enjoyed this podcast very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much for Thank all you. this, and uh, thanks it. everybody for tuning in. Thanks to uh, Alienware MMA. Uh, for uh, sponsoring all these different fighters. Uh, follow Alienware MMA on Twitter, and that's, they hooked us up with this badass laptop. And, um, and Brian's as well. Thanks to Onnit.com, O-N-N-I-T, makers of Alpha Brain, New Mood, Shroom Tech Sport, Shroom Tech Immune, and Bone Strong. That's bone supplements, son. You need to get your bones strong. Get yourself some kettlebells and battle ropes. Use the code name ROGAN. Save 10% off any and all supplements. Coming soon. Uh, we got that hemp protein shit. It's coming out soon. DVDs, instructionals on how to lift weights and get all fucking manly and swole. All that's coming. Thank you to James Maynard, James Keenan. Get him on uh, Twitter. Pusifier. Pussifer. Pussifer. Uh, Pussifer. Uh, Pussifer. That's you. And uh, my direct one is uh, the at MJ Keenan. Okay, beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. We will see you next week with uh, Tito Ortiz oh, on really? Tuesday. Yes. Fuck yeah. And uh, we also have Tom Rhodes, my friend. 
the great Tom Rhodes, a comedian, Sweet. on Thursday. So we'll see you guys next week. Thank you very much. See, Thank you. See you tonight. Jihad to you all.